morning, everyone. A warm welcome to you all to the Waterloo Innovation Summit. My name is Charmaine Dean, and I serve the institution as the Vice President, Research and International. We are so pleased to be here in Toronto today, working in partnership with Mars. I've met so many alumni at this event this morning as we're having breakfast. I want to thank you very much for taking the time to come out today, and also so many business leaders who work with the University of Waterloo, who took the time to come and talk to us today about, with us today about sustainability. So as leaders in innovation, the University of Waterloo and Mars have come together to bring you a really rich program of thought leaders and innovators who are taking on a very significant issue for this country and globally, sustainability of our transportation systems. The imperative for sustainability, of course, is unquestionable. For example, in Canada alone, 57 billion litres of fossil fuels were sold for motor vehicle use in 2021. This is a clear marker that disruptive technologies and innovations in transportation are needed if we are to see a sustainable and green future. It's no coincidence on the timing of this event Tomorrow is Earth Day. Every year on April 22nd, Earth Day is recognized globally to create awareness and enact change amongst the global population. Our hope today is that you leave with new insights and a renewed vigor for the role of technology and policy solutions as we come together locally and globally to prioritize sustainable transportation. Our program this morning can be found on your, on your tables. If you scan the QR code, um, you will see the material that relates to the schedule of the events for today. Uh, many of you would also have a card that, that uh, lists the itinerary for today. We're going to bring you discussions with leading experts on electric vehicles, sustainable aviation. You're going to hear firsthand from our amazing students and entrepreneurs who are disrupting this space. The whole social justice arena is so important for our students and entrepreneurs, and we're seeing a growing awareness and a need for looking at sustainable alternatives to transportation. And we can't do anything at scale without policy. So experts are going to weigh in on the realities of what policies, investments, and infrastructure are needed if we are to bring these technologies to life. So let's begin today's program. I'm so pleased to introduce Yang Wu. He's the CEO of Mars Discovery District. It's one of the world's largest innovation hubs. A great to be a partner with you today. He's a serial entrepreneur and an investor. Young has built breakthrough scale stage companies in enterprise software, mobile analytics, big data, media and entertainment, technology services, and biotech. Young is co-founder of the not-for-profit organization Coalition of Innovation Leaders Against Racism. He currently serves on several boards, including OMERS and the Toronto Regional Board of Trade, where he is chair. Um, importantly for today's discussion, he is a governor and council appointee to Canada's Net Zero Advisory Board. Please welcome Jiang Wu. Thank you, Charmaine, for those very warm remarks, and uh, also to you, Vivek, and to uh, Suzanne and your colleagues for partnering with Mars to host these important discussions on the future of local and global transportation. I'm thrilled to have you all in this room and to see fellow entrepreneurs, ecosystem partners, policymakers in one room. 
and one room to talk about the solutions needed to build a more sustainable future. So welcome everybody to the Mars Center. Uh, but first, let me start by acknowledging the land on which Mars is situated. For thousands of years, this has been the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Haudenosaunee, the Chippewa, and the Wendat peoples. This is the land that is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis people. The First Nations people have a culture of living in harmony with the land and the environment that surrounds them. And as such, they're always finding ways to add more back than they take from the community and the ecosystem that nourishes them. We learn from indigenous peoples that we do not inherit these lands from our ancestors. We borrow them from our children. We borrow them from our children. So it's in that spirit that I'm particularly pleased to welcome all of you to this very, very special day. And what I'd like to do is just start by saying, how do we get to that sustainable future so that we basically give back to the children that will inherit all this? There's no pathway to net zero without deeply embracing innovation over the next seven years and over the next 27 years. I'm just gonna repeat that because I think this is one of the themes that we have to look at today. There is no pathway to net zero without innovation. Canada has an opportunity to win the jump ball. It's a multi-trillion dollar global climate economy. So why not save the planet and generate a future for Canadians that is sustainable in the process? I ask why not? Because the pathway for Canada to win globally and to create global impact is through the innovation economy. The innovation economy is now arguably the most dynamic and active sector of the Canadian overall economy right now. As North America's largest innovation hub here in Mars, where you're sitting, and by the way, I have to tell the story. Thank you, Vivek, for actually making the decision when you were with U of T originally, and also basically creating the foundation for us to start this. It takes boldness, it takes vision, and it takes risk appetite. Had this been turned into condominiums, as was with the original plan, uh, before Dr. John Evans and his partners, including Vivek, decided this was not going to be condominiums, this was going to be an innovation hub. Um, if you want to look at this economically, uh, I think we have now tracked $30 billion plus of GDP contribution from this place through the community of ventures and entrepreneurs that have supported this. Thank you, Vivek. This place now represents about 40% of the startup innovation activity in Canada. Mars Supported Ventures, I think at last calculation, tracks at about five to six billion dollars of GDP contribution per year. And critically, it's growing at a compound rate of 20.7% per year. The reason I basically highlight that is because Canada's uh, productivity growth rate for Ontario's, subbing whatever you want, is less than 2%. In real dollars, less than 1%. We're talking about the innovation economy and the startup economy that is at the University of Waterloo, at the University of Toronto, at Mars. The commercialization engine here is a 10x on what is available in Canada. That's critical for us going forward. So it's not pocket change anymore. And these are not lab experiments anymore. Some of them are right here in this room today, and I'm just so proud to be associated with my fellow entrepreneurs and to see them being featured today. Well, let's talk more about them as the agenda comes on. But these are the founders and the companies that form the innovation economy. They are the backbone, the future economy of Canada. And together, they are our best bets to create the global impact and the sustainable economic growth that we need to do what? To ensure our democracy, to create the jobs of the future, to fund our quality of life. So today we're talking about the portfolio of transformative tech in the transportation sector. That sector, by the way, without innovation, currently is responsible for about 25% of Canada's annual greenhouse gas emissions. So this is a material part of how we actually address both the problem as well as the opportunity. I also want to address the topic of 
innovation infrastructure. Because that is required to create velocity and maximize the chances of success for young companies whose futures, quite honestly, and whose, whose futures are joined at the hip with Canada's futures. So here's my second point. If we want moonshot companies, and I see some with that potential in this room today, we better invest into the launch pads. Did anybody see the SpaceX launch yesterday with the Starship? Yeah, right. Many, many, many lessons to be taken from that. So thankful that that happened because it's one step along the way to getting, if you want to go to Mars, you better be able to get through these kinds of processes or to get to Moon. So, Moonshot companies and launch pads, I'm going to just say that's the formula for our future success as a nation and as a planet. You represent in this room the opportunity to kind of make that happen. So it's imperative that we maximize pathways for the talent. Well, I mean, what's a launch pad anyway as it relates to the innovation economy and the innovation ecosystem? It's the pathways for talent. It's the pathways for the intellectual property and translational research that comes from stellar academic institutions right here in Toronto, in Waterloo, in Ottawa, cities right across this province. They all have to be flowed through to commercialization hubs though, whether it's Mars or Communitech or Invest Ottawa, like the DMZ just down the street. We have to commercialize the what's coming out of our stellar institutions. So if we do that, we get to scale a knowledge-based economy that can therefore create category leading companies that are domiciled in each of your regions. And that's the key. That's the launch pad. That's how we get recurring starships coming out of here and give ourselves the maximum chance to achieve success in Canada's future. So again, in this room, we have influential institutional leaders. I can see some of you now. We have policymakers with the opportunity to amplify and to accelerate what's coming from our entrepreneurs. And we have the connections to solidify commitments and support the necessary investments to take this imperative. Drive our founders to achieve a higher rate of success and invest into the launch pads so we can fire more rockets. So I'd like to share with you three principles that I've discovered in my uh, years at Mars and my years as an entrepreneur and as an investor. I think these are at the heart of how we convert pole position, which we have globally right now in research and innovation, into a future which is built on inclusive, sustainable prosperity. Number one, talent, of course, fuels the innovation economy. Number two, ecosystems, that's your launch pads. Number three, my three C's, coalitions, collaborations, and connectivity. That's where you get network effect. You get addition through log logarithmic as opposed to negative subtraction. So at the most fundamental level, let's talk about each of these. Talent fuels innovation. Um, here in Ontario and Canada, it's essential that we recognize that universities and colleges are the crucial first phase of the talent pipeline for innovation. The quality of the research and the STEM talent produced by our universities is directly, directly linked to the formation and growth of startups and commercialization of new technologies. The Toronto region, Southern Ontario, it's already the fastest growing tech market. We decided, Vivek and I, that we're not gonna talk about the corridor. We're gonna talk about some kind of polygon construct. Uh, and uh, because when you put this all together, this is the fastest growing tech market for talent in North America, and we're already larger than what Silicon Valley or San Francisco can produce. Even after the economic shock of COVID-19, so we got to do everything we can to support our academic institutions and our urban centers as multi-generational destinations, multi-generational destinations, which means each generation reinvests their capital, their experience, their networks, their connections, their coalitions into the next generation. Silicon Valley has 90 years on us. We're probably 15 years into our journey. We get this flywheel going. It has a perpetual motion machine to it. So number two, I talked about ecosystems are the launch pads. I'd like to talk about this a bit more because a place like Mars, a place like Communitech, a place like Invest Ottawa, the incubators that exist at the University of Waterloo or at U of T or at Toronto Metropolitan University, what do they do? They take transaction costs out. 
They inject velocity. They take, I mean, in our business of commercializing startups, inertia actually kills. If you're able to inject velocity for our founders, and you can do it systemically, you're increasing the opportunities to pass Darwin's laws of natural selection, which work, by the way, perfectly for founders and entrepreneurs. So we need to create systemic support for a far higher recurring rate of success as multiple generations of successful entrepreneurs, innovators, and investors come back to reinvest into each successive generation over time. The topic we're talking about today, by the way, is a major opportunity in a major way, and we can't drop the ball on this. Clean tech. One of the sectors with the biggest potential to power the global economy, both literally and metaphorically, that's it. So as a role uh, member of the Canada Net Zero Advisory Body, as CEO of Mars, I can't stress enough the importance of climate innovation and transportation innovation to the future of Canada's economic future. And even with you know, Silicon Valley bank collapses and funding moving as a result of high interest rates, interesting thing, um, we're actually seeing more money flow into the clean tech space in Canada from a venture capital perspective, even with that kind of a backdrop. So I'm thrilled that we're exploring the potential for the transportation sector from EV advancements to transformational high-speed mass travel today. I see some examples, uh, Transpod, Ryan, I'm looking forward to hearing your talk as well. And so we have huge opportunities, and this is the challenge of this group. How do we convert the opportunities into commercial, sustainable, economic futures that save the planet? Simple challenge. I think we'll get to it by lunchtime, right? So um, let me talk a bit about uh, my um, other final topic which is coalitions, connections, and collaborations driving network effect. It's important because in this room we represent the entire innovation economy, but we tend to operate in silos, or we have traditionally operated in silos. We haven't maximized the opportunity to connect up what each of us do in our institutions, organizations, to really drive the multiplier effect. We can be proud of the fact that in recent years, I think we've made great strides encouraging commercialization of research in this province. Uh, most universities in Ontario, including University of Waterloo, now have startup incubators or accelerators doing great work. The DMZ just down the road at Toronto Metropolitan University, uh, UTEST at University of Toronto, uh, the great work coming out of great research and great brain power at the University of Waterloo, but what I think we need to do better is to activate the entire ecosystem, to build coalitions, to work on a polygon, not just the corridor or not just the institutional dot. Because that basically takes out inertia and it drives velocity. That's how we win. It also means converting brilliant stuff coming from our universities to actually create category leading companies that stay here. If we don't have that, we build great companies that inevitably leave here. And that is the loss. So to get to the global stage, we need to break down the barriers between our institutions. And this morning, I challenge the different groups that have traditionally worked in silos to really take advantage of this time together to talk about what actionable ideas can we spark in this room? How can we mine this unique opportunity for all of us being in one place, right here, one time? There's a power to the broader tech ecosystem in our networks our cities and our institutions. United, we can be a true market maker that attracts capital, that attracts customers, that attracts talent, that has the scale to build a Canadian knowledge-based economy. Divided, we remain market takers that are doomed to export from a resource-based economy. And in this case, I'm adding IP and talent to natural resources like oil and gas, like mining, and like lumber. Divided, we remain market takers, where we export our strengths and buy back someone else's ability to create value in a knowledge-based economy. So I'm now so pleased to introduce Vivek Goal, President, Vice Chancellor, University of Waterloo, a origin story of Mars as well, and a giant 
among giants in our innovation economy. Please give Yvette a very, very warm hand. <laughs> Thanks, Young, for the uh, kind introduction. And uh, thank you for your contributions here to Mars. And uh, I'm sure many people saw the news that Young is coming to the end of his uh, term at the end of this calendar year. Uh, you know, having watched Mars now for over 20 years, um, it's fair to say the early years were rocky. And, um, and you know, I think uh, Ilza Chernick did an tremendous job navigating the place through those rocky years. Uh, but Young really came in ready to take this to the next level, and you have done that. And we look forward to working with your successor as we take the entire polygon, or whatever we call it, to the next level beyond. The other thing I'll just reflect on is um, a line. I remember um, Heather Monroe Bloom, who was the Vice President of Research at the University of Toronto, when the original conception was uh, being put together. And you know, people in government were having trouble really understanding what we were talking about. And uh, she said, think of the world's first RMT park on a subway line. And as I walked off the subway, it was a direct connection to the building. I reflected on, you know, as we, we weren't thinking about it from a sustainability perspective. We were thinking about it from the connection perspective that people could come easily in and out. Most R&T parks, including the one we have at Waterloo, tend to be remote, <laughs> although we now have an LRT running through our uh, uh, park as well. Um, but this was really the world's first in an urban setting, and it is, I think, the largest urban innovation center in the world, and it's great to see it's been achieved, and it's helping sustainability. I also really appreciate the uh, three themes. Uh, obviously, they resonate very much for us, uh, talent, we are all about talent, and we see many of our talented entrepreneurs, but I also know we have many students here from different programs right across the university and environment, sustainability, the Conrad School of Business and Entrepreneurship and Technology, and it's all that talent coming together, which fits with your third set of Cs that really is what we need to work towards. And I really like the use of your term, velocity, because our incubator program is called Velocity. <laughs> and uh, I'm sure our marketing folks are here. They're going to be taking every word that you have to say. And uh, it's great, as you, as you noted, to see how many different groups are represented in this room. We have private sector leaders. We have researchers from academe and um, private research institutions. We have community organizations. And we have all three levels of government um, and we have many representatives from municipal and regional governments uh, right across uh, the area. Now, at the University of Waterloo, we do pride ourselves on working to solve the most complex challenges facing humanity and our planet. And as you've noted, as we all know, the climate crisis is our biggest existential threat. And I absolutely agree with Young's point that innovation is essential. We will not meet the targets that we have, even as we look at our own campuses and how we can meet our targets for carbon neutrality. We will not do that without technologies do, that do not exist today. And for that, we need innovation. We need to translate that research. But we also know that it's not just going to be the technology alone because we need the right sets of policies, regulatory frameworks, funding models. We also need to think about behavioral factors, adoption of new technologies. And that's where, again, the collaborations and connections across so many different disciplines and areas, and I think in our panels, we'll be bringing people from many different disciplines to think about those issues. And in terms of transportation, the theme today, you know, it's very easy to think or to suggest we just need to reduce transportation. And we lived through an experiment three years ago where we were all unable to travel. We were all unable to leave our homes. And who enjoyed that? <laughs> um, you know, we can reduce the amount of transportation, the number of trips that we take, 
but we will never eliminate it. There is a human need to be with others, just like we're gathered today. And, and so we do need to work towards those creative solutions. And I look forward to the presentations that we're going to have today from researchers, from our entrepreneurs, about those technologies that will allow us to move forward. And with that, it's really a great pleasure to say a few words about the Waterloo Institute of Sustainable Aeronautics. This is uh, a new endeavor, I guess not so new now, it's about 15 <coughs> months old, um, that is fostering interdisciplinary inquiry, cross-sector partnerships, and informing policy. This institute involves faculty from all of our six faculties at the University of Waterloo. WISA, as it's called, and its partners are well positioned for a future where social, economic, and environmental sustainability will be baked into nearly all decision making. The vision for creating WISA came from Dr. Suzanne Kearns, and it has really taken off since inception. She leads a group of more than 150 faculty members who are all driven to make WISA the world's leading hub for sustainable aeronautical research, technology, and education. Dr. Kearns is a professor of aviation at the University of Waterloo. Her research explores how to optimize the education and performance of the next generation of aviation professionals. She is an airplane and helicopter pilot and is an internationally recognized leader within the aviation and aerospace industries. Please welcome Dr. Kearns to the stage. so much. Uh, it's such a pleasure to be with you all today and to tell you a little bit about WISA, the Waterloo Institute for Sustainable Aeronautics. Before we dive in, I'd just like to tell you a little bit about my background. So I grew up in a small town. You may have heard of it. We have an albino groundhog that predicts the weather uh, once a year, um, Wyerton. Um, and my, my childhood home was under the flight path of the local airport. And so you know, ever since I can remember, I would tell my parents, you know, I want to do that one day. I want a career in the skies. And my parents, being the amazing folks that they are, they said, well, if you want to do it, just go ahead and do it. So I started flight training when I was 15. I soloed on my 16th birthday, and that's a newspaper clipping when I flew a helicopter to land on my grandparents' front lawn when I was 17. The, the three-place drug charges was not associated with my background. That's very really curious. Um, but, but my role today is, uh, has evolved. So while I dreamed of being a pilot, uh, my path took me in a slightly different direction. I am very proud to work with who I think are the best students at the University of Waterloo, our, our aviation students. Uh, many of you may not realize that Waterloo hosts Canada's largest pilot training university program. So we take in about 120 students each year who throughout those four-year degrees uh, will uh, become fully qualified pilots and will enter the aviation sector. I'm the only aviation professor uh, at Waterloo and, and really dedicated to supporting these students. I often say uh, aviation students are my people and, and this, this uh, photo is, uh, there's a hidden famous person in the photo, so bonus points if you can pick that out. Uh, Chris Hadfield's a, a wonderful supporter of our program. But something really interesting happened uh, before the pandemic, something that had never happened to me before. So uh, at the end of a lecture, I had students come to me at the front of the room and they said, is it possible to love aviation and love the planet at the same time? And that had never, nobody had ever said that to me before. And, and I was asking them, I'm like, well, just tell me more, what are you thinking? And they said that my peers are making fun of me and they're saying, why would you wanna be part of an industry that's contributing to climate change why would you want to be part of an industry that's part of the problem? And this is really striking because I've uh, you know, been in aviation for a long time, I've been an uh, aviation professor for 20 years, and I can tell you that environmental considerations were not part of the curriculum when I was studying. It was almost counterculture. It was something that, that just did not come up. And it was the, the young people bringing it to me, which is really eye-opening and really sort of striking that we need to do something different. And the reality is that they're not wrong. The uh, aviation sector does have an environmental challenge. So again, this is all uh, pre-pandemic, but I have a series here of, of billboards that were put up 
to draw attention to the aviation sector's greenwashing. And the reality is that um, aviation contributes about 2% uh, of emissions, but the reality is a lot of that is for trips that people consider to be optional uh, or for fun. So relatively, it has a pretty substantial impact on people's emissions. And the marketing's quite clever as well. <laughs> so, so the reality is that uh, pre-pandemic, if you can think back to this time, there was a growing uh, awareness of the flight shaming movement. Uh, Greta Thunberg was famously leading climate protests outside of international aviation conferences. And the world was really waking up to the idea that uh, aviation has an inordinate impact on climate. And then the pandemic hit. When the pandemic hit, I know it affected all of our lives, uh, but I can sort of share with you that those in aviation really suffered. For about two years, uh, young people were pretty much completely out of work. Uh, many of these students I know really well. And uh, the challenge with becoming a pilot is that it costs between $120,000 to $150,000 to pay for your flight training. So we had all of these young people carrying massive student loans, many with young families, and with no ability to financially support those families. And I remember feeling a tremendous sense of guilt because I'm working for a university and my salary was secure. And I felt really driven to ask what a university could do to support the sector so that when a recovery did happen, perhaps the industry would be in a better position than they were beforehand. So I started asking myself, okay, well, what are the big challenges facing the future viability of air transportation? We talked already about the environmental sustainability. I think that's one of the biggest challenges uh, facing long-term viability. The second is global personnel shortages. So pre-pandemic, we knew that if the entire global training capacity was working at 100%, they still would not be able to produce enough pilots, controllers, maintenance engineers to support the sector. So we knew that these shortages were on the horizon. And I'll often tell my students, even if we had brilliant technology that was net zero for aircraft, if we didn't have the people to fly those aircraft, or the maintainers to keep them safe, or the controllers to ensure safe separation, we'd never realize the benefits. So the people are an essential part of the system. And I think the third big challenge is keeping ahead of rapidly evolving technologies. Before anything touches an aircraft, it has to be certified, it has to be safe. And while technologies can have you know, significant benefits for society, things like 5G, for example, they pose a lot of unknowns to the air transport sector. Is it safe? Could it disrupt aspects of flight operations? Cybersecurity is essential as well. Like all of the security in an airport, if you could access that aircraft remotely, then you're bypassing all of those uh, measures. So what I started doing is, so these are the three challenges I identified, and then I started looking across campus, and I realized University of Waterloo has world-leading experts in multidisciplinary fields that relate to these challenges. And so I had a new dream. And my new dream was, can you imagine what would be possible if we just went around campus and we tapped faculty members and students on the shoulder and said, have you ever thought about applying your work to aviation? And, and that's really how it started. So I would uh, go and meet with different faculty. I would say, tell me about your research. And I would say, yeah, let me tell you about how that relates to aviation challenges. And we started gaining momentum. And through this process, sort of one person at a time, uh, we started uh, gathering together some strength, um, and we started recognizing, is this really a future focus, right? If we're talking about the long-term viability of air transportation, really what we're talking about is sustainability. And while I think a lot of us, when we hear the word sustainability, think about the environmental impacts, but sustainability is really multidimensional, right? It's, it's not uh, only about the environment, it's about the environment, the people, and the planet, and it's about this focus of trying to meet our needs today without sacrificing future generations' ability to meet their needs. So interestingly, uh, those three challenges that I identified, so the lack of a workforce, the environmental emissions, and uh, ensuring we can have evidence-based integration of new technologies, align with the three pillars of sustainability. So social, environmental, and economic sustainability. And even though we, we sort of present it as three pillars, they're far more interconnected than they are separate. And this formed a big vision. And the big vision was for WISA, or a research institute. So we took uh, this proposal, that, and we, what we imagined basically was uh, WISA bringing together researchers from all corners of campus, taking their existing knowledge and expertise and relating it to aviation challenges. 
uh, under this theme of sustainability. So our mission, again, is to become a world-leading hub of sustainable aeronautical research, technology, and education. But because we have these three pillars, it really does touch every corner of campus. So uh, researchers who are in, for example, neuroscience, they would say, well, I'm not an aviation expert. I'm like, you know what, aviation has lots of aviation experts. We need your expertise uh, to come into campus. And so they're looking at using things like eye tracking to understand how pilots learn and pilot performance and linking that to training pilots more effectively. So there's lots of really exciting examples. Um, but that was the mission. So the proposal to establish WISA went to the University of Waterloo Senate in June of 2021, and we launched in October. So we were about uh, 18 months old. And ultimately, uh, research institutes, there's uh, complicated ways to describe them, but when you sort of define it down, it's really just about two simple things. It's about trying to foster education and trying to foster research while being a bridge. So we think of uh, one end of the bridge being on campus and the other end of the bridge being an industry and government. And we're trying to make sure that those research and educational activities are aligned with real needs so that we can have real impact and value. So a few of the activities we did in our first year, uh, WISA launched a design competition for students where we challenged students to imagine how a flight school could be a beacon of sustainability both from an architectural building design perspective, but also how flight simulators being electric, uh, if you can validate their use, can reduce the amount of flying that's done in fuel burning aircraft. Uh, we also have a, an e-learning course uh, called Aviation Fundamentals, uh, which is about 20 hours in duration, distributed in partnership with the United Nations Special Agency. And um, that's been completed by over 4,500 learners from 99 different countries. We just need one more, then a nice round number. Um, and a big activity was, well, what about graduate education? And we didn't think that we wanted to create an entirely new graduate program because that's not really the mission. The mission of WISA is to take the existing depth of strength that exists on campus and again, to kind of tap folks on the shoulder and say, hey, come over and, and apply your work to aviation. So we wanted to follow that same model for graduate studies and we created in WISA's first year what's called the Collaborative Aeronautics Program or the CAP. So the CAP takes existing master's and PhD programs and it adds one course, it's a foundation of how aviation works. One course, it's a consulting course where student teams work directly in partnership with industry and then they apply their research to aeronautics in a way that's true to their discipline. And then when those students graduate, they have their degree title enhanced with DASH Aeronautics. Uh, so this first cohort launched uh, in September. I just finished teaching the second course a few weeks back and I'm very, very excited. I told the students, I'm like, Whoever gets their diploma first, take a picture and send it to me because I'm really excited to see that DASH aeronautics uh, come through. But at maturity, we expect this program could train up to 50 uh, future leaders every year. Uh, so we think that this could be a really powerful pipeline. And of course, from a research perspective, the other real pillar of what WISA does, uh, I'll give you just a few quick highlights. Uh, this is a Pipistrel. It's a fully electric aircraft. It produces 98% fewer emissions. It only has a 40 minute range, so it's not, it's not the uh, mature solution uh, to the, our sustainability challenge, but it's a start and it's a piece of research equipment that our researchers will be using and validating to imagine how electric aviation can play a piece in uh, pilot training across Canada. Also because uh, these student pilots are the people who are closest to my heart, I always want to highlight that it's a really unique thing in the world to have a research intensive university that also has hundreds of student pilots on campus as part of that ecosystem. And it benefits them because it enriches their education when they participate in research. And our researchers, as I've said, they've never had an easier time recruiting participants for their studies. So it's a, it's a pretty cool thing that benefits both sides. Uh, we also uh, led the effort to bring a flight simulator on campus, which is used on a daily basis to ask, uh, look into aspects of how pilots learn. And very recently, uh, just in the last few weeks, we were really thankful to receive a significant investment from FedDev of $9.17 million. Uh, the purpose of these funds were to catalyze WISE's ability to grow this ecosystem. He mentioned ecosystem earlier. And uh, this part almost makes me emotional because when we imagined WISE, the big dream was what if we could get all the researchers on campus to imagine with us how their work relates to aviation. And so $4.5 million of these funds we had an open, competitive request for proposal process. Uh, we asked researchers to send us their proposals of how their work relates to aeronautical sustainability. We received about 85 proposals and we funded 39 individual projects that are underway right now. So it really has realized uh, that big dream. 
We're also establishing an innovation hub uh, at the uh, local airport with new SIMs to test green technology, developing two new e-learning courses to upskill the industry <coughs> on sustainability and climate change, and we're uh, just right now launching pitch competitions to support small and medium companies uh, across Ontario. So overall, uh, really proud and thankful to the leadership at the University of Waterloo, to my fellow faculty members and students who were willing to imagine a dream alongside us on this vision. And more than anything, even though we know aviation is a very difficult sector to decarbonize, we hope that WISA can be part of the, the eventual solution and work directly alongside industry and government towards achieving these big goals. Thank you. So I think uh, we have a few minutes for questions. Uh, if anyone has a question, they could raise their hand and there are uh, runners at the back of the room. Maybe just a second so we have a picture. Hi, so this uh, may not be directly related to uh, this green, uh, uh, green uh, making the aviation green, rather. Uh, we've heard of stories about uh, aviation and antiquated systems and technologies like mainframe systems which go down. We hear the horror stories. Planes being cancelled, people being stranded in airports. So obviously when you talk about technology and aviation, there seems to be a long way to go for certain, for the airlines and other things. Maybe any thoughts on that area, please, for your side. Yeah, so uh, there's a lot of challenges in aviation, but there's also a, a long, rich history that a lot of folks are really proud of. So the challenge is that before anything can touch aviation, it has to be certified, it has to be safe, and so there's a regulatory burden to clear to get to that point. So it's very challenging to have an entirely new technology that can be integrated quickly and address a lot of these problems. That being said, there's a new market of electric vertical takeoff and landing aircraft called eVTOL, uh, and there's a lot of excitement. They don't like this reference, but it's sort of like Jetsons, like they're like big human-carrying drones. Um, but uh, there's a lot of excitement about how these eVTOLs could redefine urban landscapes by moving people around cities uh, in new and innovative ways. Um, that being said, it's sort of building aviation up from scratch all over again, so there's a lot of challenges. They need their own air traffic control, their own training, it's a different kind of flying. Um, that being said, in traditional aviation, while there's a lot of passionate people, that's sort of the one thing that's true about aviation, people love aviation, it becomes part of their identity. The challenge is there's a lack of diversity, only about 5% of pilots are women. There's uh, huge financial barriers for young people, and I see students all the time struggling with poverty, and. Uh, literally working just to buy those hours of training. Um, and the system itself has massive shortages and we've known about this for years. So the traditional system that we have has a lot of flaws. Industry is aware of them and it is working on it, but it will take a fair bit of innovation before we can find a better path forward. I think we're short on time, so but I'm available during break and happy to, to chat with anyone who has questions. Thank you. Amazing story, Suzanne, of crisis leading to transformation, but it would have only happened with your thought leadership and uh, your can-do attitude. Thank you. So I'd like to introduce our first panel, electric vehicles, really important for this conversation. The technology and challenges for mass adoption is the title of the session, and it's moderated by Tyler Hamilton. Tyler is the Senior Director of Climate at Mars and guides all climate-related activities for ventures, for corporate partners, investors, including the flagship mission for Mars program. Please welcome Tyler, and Tyler will introduce our panelists. Hey, everybody. Good morning. I'm going to start before I introduce the panelists asking the room, um, show of hands, who owns an electric car? Wow, that's pretty low. I wasn't expecting that. Okay, who over the next three years plans to have an electric car? All right, we're getting better. Um, who, like me, 
And I, I only put this one in there because I'm very frustrated with right now. Who has a deposit down on an electric car and can't get one? <laughs> I keep hearing stories about there's so much demand out there or so much growth, but I, I just can't get one. I'm like nine, month, nine months ago, I put down a deposit. I'm being told every time I check in, another 18 months, another 18 months. Anyway, it's good news that they're popular. I, I think that uh, the federal government's plans to introduce a mandate in Canada will, will help a lot. Um, and there's some other things going on uh, from a policy perspective that I think is really going to drive our industry forward. Um, globally, last year, uh, the electric vehicle uh, industry, and when I say electric vehicle, I mean plug-in vehicles, the ones that you charge uh, from a socket, uh, grew by 60% according to the International Energy Agency. Um, so that equates to roughly one in seven people, um, or one in seven cars on the road that year that were purchased uh, being electric. Um, compared to Canada, we're at around one out of every 11. Uh, in Europe and China, it's about, uh, I think China's four. Um, sorry, one, in Canada, we're one out of every 10. In, in China, we're four out of every 10. And in the US, it's five out of every 10. So, um, in North America, we do have, and particularly in Canada, we do have a lot of catching up to do. Um, anyway, I just wanted to provide that as background because there, there's a lot going on on the innovation side to support the electric vehicle industry, uh, but we really have to drive more and more um, uh, usage uh, just if we want to catch up to the global scene. It's my pleasure to introduce our panelists, and I'm going to ask them each to come up and, and take a seat. Um, just not that one closest to the podium because that's mine. <laughs> So first is uh, Ivrik Pasco Rangon, Assistant Professor, Faculty of Engineering at the University of Waterloo. <laughs> Next is uh, Zach Lefebvre, CEO and founder of ChargeLab. <laughs> and finally, Mabel Fulford, Director, Innovation Partnerships at Peak Power. Let's get started. Um, I've given a little bit of context here. Obviously, electric vehicles are a very meaty subject. Um, there's a lot of different things that we can talk about, but the panelists here today really are going to be tackling two things. One is charging infrastructure, right? If we're going to have electric vehicles on the road, we've got to figure out how to charge them and, uh, and basically um, how to do so faster. Uh, and that also brings us to battery innovation, right? Can the batteries improve? How much are they improving? Are there different chemistries that we can uh, uh, introduce into the marketplace that can, that can really you know, turbo boost and allow us to make a trip from, say, Toronto to Montreal on a single charge? And, and maybe there's some cars out there where they claim that can be done, but I think there's still a lot of kind of concern about doing it. So um, we're not quite there yet. So I'm going to, first of all, ask each of our panelists to spend 30 to 60 seconds just talking a little bit about your roles, your companies, or, or your research. And uh, then we're going to dive into questions. So why don't we start with Mabel. Thanks, Tyler. So I'm Peak Power's Director of Innovation Partnerships. Peak Power is an energy software company. Uh, our distributed energy resources aggregation platform allows batteries, buildings, and vehicles to participate in the grid. So that reduces energy costs and also reduces emissions. Uh, we're a, a rapidly growing startup company, and I, and I can't pass up the opportunity in this audience to say we are always hiring. And we <laughs> also do offer some internships, so if you're interested in, in joining us or learning more, please do check out our website. Actually, I have, uh, this is a Peak Power notepad that I got. <laughs> very happy to get that one. Uh, Ibrick. Yes, so my name is Ibrick. I'm a new professor in chemical engineering at University of Waterloo but I uh, also have formal training in mechanical and electrical engineering, and this multidisciplinary approach I think is essential in uh, producing and engineering more robust, uh, longer lasting and faster charging uh, lithium ion batteries. Mm -hmm. The lab is uh, focusing on uh, the fundamental transport of charges inside uh, battery cells, and that not only uh, goes towards making faster charging uh, cells that can power smaller battery packs that are 
uh, cheaper and uh, more affordable for more affordable cars because they could be charged uh, more often and faster. But also they also uh, produce less heat that uh, enables longer lasting <coughs> sorry uh, longer lasting sales because there's less degradation inside and that is also good for second hand uh, EV market that we need. So in a nutshell, what I'm, uh, my lab is working on is what I would call more uh, transportation grade lithium ion battery that can be as versatile and as resilient as the internal combustion uh, technology that we have right now for like a more healthy uh, market for EVs in the future. Great, thank you. Zach? Hi everyone, I'm Zach. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Charge Lab. We are a 60-person startup that builds software for managing electric vehicle chargers and infrastructure. Uh, we're a very proud Toronto-based company. We're a member of Mars Clean Tech. Uh, we recruit lots of engineers from University of Waterloo. Uh, so very excited to be here. Um, we don't build the actual EV charging hardware, but we provide a back-end cloud-based software layer. Uh, we actually manage the largest public DC fast charging network in Ontario, as well as thousands of chargers in fleet depots and condo buildings and office buildings all across North America. Okay, so the next question, or the first question I'm gonna address to all of you. Um, I mentioned, I hinted at uh, range anxiety. I've been covering this sector. I used to be a journalist. I used to cover um, the kind of growth of this uh, industry. Back in the days when people were hacking um, Toyota uh, Priuses, you know, and, and turning them into plugins, and uh, it's been phenomenal to see the growth over the past, uh, oh my God, 15 years. I can see the gray in my beard here. Um, range anxiety, is it still really an issue? Because the media still like to play it up, even though it's been the same story told for 15 years. Is it really an issue? Are we really there yet, where people can just stop and you know, kind of chill out about that? Just who wants to weigh in? I would say uh, my short answer to that is no. Okay. Not in the way that, that most of us think of it and that most of us have heard about it. Um, I know Zach has some great stats on this, so I'll speak to the anecdotal side. I have not spoken to a single EV driver who has range anxiety. It is something that, um, that does still concern some people before buying an EV, but it's largely because most of us think about uh, charging an EV it, the same way that we think about fueling a car, which is actually really quite inconvenient if you think about it, to have to go and drive somewhere to, to fuel up every few days. Um, most people charge their EVs like you would a laptop or a phone. The vast majority of the time, they're plugging it in at home, for example, charging overnight, and the second most common place people charge is work when they're parked all day. Um, Many people charge at work also because right now it's often free. Um, uh, and so uh, it's still really important to invest in uh, fast charging infrastructure for those few occasions in the year where you know, we go on a road trip. Um, but for most people, this is not an issue. And it also speaks to an opportunity that most of the time for, for an average car, 95% of the time it's parked gives us a lot of flexibility to manage when cars charge, um, which, is, which is relevant when we look at the grid side of how is our grid going to accommodate this new charging load. So I'm gonna ask Zach to answer that next and then go to Ebert just because I wanna stay on the theme of um, yeah, you know, this software. For sure. Um, so I think it, it's much less a blocker for buying an electric vehicle and anxiety. I would call it more range inconvenience. Um, and what I mean by that is like when I came into this industry, there were literally questions about whether you could take an electric vehicle from Toronto to Montreal or New York uh, and certainly across the country. Um, now every uh, summer, you know, I have like dozens of people in my network who are driving their EV across Canada, out to Vancouver, driving it back. Uh, it used to just be Teslas that you could do this with and you can now do this with basically any electric vehicle. So the infrastructure problem is, is largely um, solved and in place, it's now a convenience issue where it takes longer to fill up your EV along the road, uh, which is I think where uh, Ivrick's research is, is coming in and really relevant. Great segue. Yes. Ivrick. Let's talk about the battery side of things. 
But then on the benefit side, so I, I wouldn't agree that uh, range anxiety has diminished a lot, and especially because uh, we have so much more charging stations, more, much more convenient, but the battery, as usual, is still the limiting factor in many states. So there's uh, three problems I can see. The first one is, uh, is cost, uh, and, and meaning the cost of charging, of fast charging, because uh, so the people who have an electric car here may attest to this, you need to precondition your battery to accept the fast charge. So basically it means that you need to heat it up so that uh, the battery is ready for fast charging. But then when you fast charge, you need to cool down the battery so that it doesn't catch fire. So all of this uh, extra energy is wasted compared to a, uh, a trickle charge. So that's more cost. Also uh, longevity. So if you fast charge a car, uh, you, can't, you can only do that a number of times until the battery loses its capacity. So that most likely weigh on people's mind when they uh, will want to fast charge. And mm -hmm. finally, the charging, the fast charging itself is still slow, <laughs> even though it's a fast, you call it fast charge, but it's like 30 to 45 minutes compared to a, a gasoline or diesel car, it's, uh, which is about one and a half, or two minutes. It's much more, so we still have some way to go uh, in terms of battery technology to really make range of anxiety something of the past. It's interesting that heating issue that you raised. There's a company in Ottawa, some of you may have heard of it, called G Batteries, a uh, software company, and uh, they try to uh, manage that situation using pulse charging and uh, using a special algorithm that is always kind of monitoring the state of the battery and then it turns off the, 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 the charging, but then kind of puts it back on in, in, a, in a way where it's charging faster because you're not getting the overheating. When you overheat, it slows down the charging. So um, there, there are solutions out there, and it's great to see that they're coming out of uh, Canada. Um, on the software side, it's a, that's another great segue. A lot of people think about EVs, they, like it's, they think it's hardware, and they think about the batteries. But software plays a crucial role, and I just want to ask you, starting off, uh, going back to you, Zach, and then and Mabel, it would, would be great to get your perspective on this. Um, how important has software been to increase demand and, uh, and uh, also drive more interest in EVs? Yeah, so one of the fascinating things about electric vehicles, if you're not familiar, um, is that any of the outlets in this room you could charge your vehicle on. You can charge an electric vehicle on a 120 volt outlet, so literally anywhere that you plug in your smartphone, you can plug in your car and charge. And so we are in the business of building software for managing charging stations. And so the question comes up, like, why do you need software, right? Like, when I want to charge my iPhone, I just plug it in. Um, and the answer is that, uh, yes, you can plug in a car into any outlet, but that's going to be a pretty slow charge. And that's what we call level one charging. Uh, the most common kind of charging that, that most EV drivers use most of the time is called level two charging. That uses a 240 volt outlet like your dryer or um, an electric stove if, or um, oven if you have one. Um, and then the fastest type of charging that we've been talking about is called DC fast charging or level three charging, which is comparable to a gas pump. In fact, these chargers look a lot like a gas pump. Um, but as you kind of go up from the trickle charging, level one charging of just plugging into an outlet, uh, these EVs start to pull a lot of power. And so whoever you are pulling that power from likely wants to bill you, uh, whether that's an office building or a condo building that you live in. Um, and so we build software to connect the chargers and enable that, that billing and payments. Um, but even more importantly, all of our infrastructure was not designed with electric vehicles in mind. Um, meaning, if there is a condo building with 500 units, it may be the reality that you could only put 10 or 15 EV chargers in the basement of that building. And that's going to be insufficient for eventually having 100, 200, you know, possibly 500 electric vehicles in this condo building. Um, so one of the things that our software does is load balancing. So we'll take that condo building that can only support 15 EV chargers and we'll go and install 45 or 80. Um, and then if you happen to plug in at a time when nobody else in your building is plugged in, you get kind of a full charging rate, but everybody kind of comes home and plugs in at, 
at 6 p.m. We can, um, we can balance the load. And then this becomes really in interesting from a cost savings perspective and then also uh, from an environmental perspective where ultimately consumers are kind of lazy and we don't want to like go out to our garage at, or especially in our condo building, go down to our, our, our basement to like plug in our car when the grid becomes cheap and clean. So with software, we can automate and schedule all of these things uh, and actually build a lot of, of grid resiliency. resiliency. Uh, but I think Peak Power also does a lot of really fa fascinating work right in this line. Yeah, and, and Mabel, I want to get your perspective on this, but just a quick follow up there, Zach. Um, I believe I once heard you describe your software as the Android, like of, of Correct. electric vehicles. We don't build any hardware, um, but we sit on top, or we build, we sit on top of hardware built by folks like ABB and Eaton and yeah. Siemens, um, and we really believe in this open ecosystem, right? We're, we're gonna we're talking about a smart grid with um, dozens of brands of vehicles and different equipment, and it's really important that all of these things plug in together. And actually, being open and interoperable is one of the hardest parts of, uh, of scaling infrastructure. So it helps to future-proof it as well, right? So when a building owner maybe wants to add a couple of new chargers and it's a new model or a different yeah. brand, it allows them to integrate it into the, the fleet of chargers that they have, which might be different models. And totally. Everything. Awesome. Uh, Mabel, okay, so building on that, um, I also want to get into the intelligence that's increasingly making its way into the software that drives uh, charging. Um, could you talk a little bit about the role of, of you know, what Peak Power is doing around vehicle to grid um, or bi-directional charging and, and what that future looks like and how it can drive demand? Absolutely. Um, bi-directional charging really is a game changer. Um, and so as, as Zach said, the one directional managed charging or smart charging software is an absolute necessity to allow us to uh, to adopt EVs on a wide scale for our electricity grid. Um, but bi-directional charging actually allows us to translate that from a challenge into an opportunity. So with, with bi-directional charging, electric vehicles can soak up renewable power when the wind is blowing and the sun is shining and feed it back to the grid at the times when it's actually needed. Uh, it can all, bi-directional EVs can also provide backup power by providing power to buildings directly. And so what that means is that not only can electric vehicles reduce emissions in the transportation sector by displacing gasoline and diesel powered vehicles, but they can also help us decarbonize our grid for all of the other end users by allowing us to, uh, to balance out those uh, variable renewables on our grid and provide a lot more flexibility that decreases the cost of our grid and, and provides a more resilient, flexible grid, um, especially at those times when the grid is under strain at peak, peak moments of, uh, of demand. The, um, uh, unfortunately, most of us can't go out today and buy a bi-directional electric vehicle and charger, but by no means is it futuristic. Uh, the Nissan LEAF has been bi-directional capable since about 2011. Um, uh, we are hoping that there will be uh, bi-directional chargers available for Nissan LEAF owners soon, but they're not available yet. Um, and the electric uh, Ford F-150 actually uh, has a bi-directional backup home package available. Um, and Peak Power has a, a pilot project called Peak Drive, which is literally just a few blocks from where we're sitting here, um, with 20 Nissan Leafs, 20 bi-directional chargers, and they are participating in the grid today. They earn about $8,000 a year by providing power back to those buildings at the uh, peak days in the year. And so you can see how this can make a really big difference. It creates a virtuous cycle by paying electric vehicles for providing these services, uh, it also reduces the lifetime cost of electric vehicles, accelerates the adoption of electric vehicles, and provides you know, more of those flexible resources available to the grid. And, and creating integrations with uh, software such as Charge Lab allows um, price signals and, and allows uh, policies and mechanisms to, for example, Peak Power's uh, software can send a signal to the Charge Lab network of charges saying, 
hey, it's a, it's a peak moment of demand right now. There is an incentive if you're willing to provide power from your battery back into the grid. On the bi-directional charging theme, can you, like the, the Ford F-150 as an example, the electric, can you um, use it if another car is bi-directional to charge another car? Like I'm, I'm try, trying to think of the future of like Canadian Automobile Association, right? Like you, you run out of juice and a Ford F-150 comes and plugs in and just gives you enough to get to the next charging station. Is that, is that kind of, is that possible? It comes up a lot. Okay. I haven't seen a solution for it yet. Yeah. Um, in theory, it would be possible. Okay. Um, and I mean, the, the electric Ford F-150, it has, I mean, it has all sorts of gizmos, um, but uh, you know, you can plug power tools into it. Mm -hmm. you, it, it has also just an actual socket yeah. um, in the vehicle. And so it becomes kind of a mobile command center. You can run your office out of it, <laughs> you know. Yeah. It's, uh, so, uh, you know, I, we use the analogy a lot that, uh, uh, that similar to how a smartphone today is, is much more than a phone, a vehicle not too far from now is similarly gonna do many more things than just drive you from A to B. Interesting. Yeah, I could just see software being developed that allows you to monetize that too if you decide to pull over and charge somebody else's vehicle. Get on that. I, I do think, um, <laughs> don't, I, don't quote me on this, but I do think uh, Rivian actually has that capability. Really? I've seen some articles about people charging each other's Rivians. But it, just like to plug EVs, it is really great. Um, I drive an EV and you don't have to worry about like leaving your car running and polluting the environment uh, just so you can have AC in the summer. I just like, you know, leave my car running, it's cool, I go get my takeout, I come back. And so whether it's power tools or AC or music or movies while you're waiting to pick up your kid and you're watching it on your screen, uh, EVs are just this kind of like level up over when you have a very dangerous internal combustion engine as your source of power. Hey Rick, I want to give most of the rest of the time back to you to talk about the battery stuff and your research and do a deeper dive there. Um, lithium ion, as you know, is kind of like the king of, of battery chemistry. Um, there are lithium shortages that are driving up prices and there's a lot of innovation happening on that side. Do you think it will always be king or is, is the type of research you're working on leading to alternatives or I'm just very curious to get your perspective on the future of what batteries are going to look like? Yes. Um so at the moment, lithium ion is king. And uh, it's uh, difficult to actually answer this question with any type of accuracy because that depends on uh, technological breakthroughs who are notoriously uh, very difficult to predict in terms of timeline and, on, and scope because we don't know where they're going to occur and what they're going to bring to the table. Also, uh, it also depends on where lithium ion batteries will be at the time of this. So at the moment, the uh, alternative technology for lithium-ion batteries is called solid-state batteries. So they are quite actually similar to lithium-ion batteries, except that they have a solid electrolyte, which mm. brings a few uh, um, significant... Must be safer. Yes, yeah. uh, uh, significant advantages. One of it is safety, because uh, you don't have this uh, flammable liquid electrolyte, but it's it's uh, disputed at some point because if uh, you have a puncture, for instance, uh, the energy has to go somewhere mm -hmm. and will eventually catch fire anyway. Yeah, firefighters don't <laughs> like that. <laughs> but uh, they have other advantages is the fact that they can have about 50% more energy density in them, uh, as predicted, because they replace the anode with uh, just lithium metal. So at this point, they are not really displacing the lithium uh, consumption but they could displace the ion batteries. Mm -hmm. uh, and they can also charge faster for that, uh, for because of that, because the graphite anode is the one of the limiting factor. But they also introduce a new problem, which is the solid electrolyte itself, which is uh, less uh, able to uh, transport charge, especially at low temperatures we have in, in, we have in Canada. So, and the last problem is there's only one more, is that the production of those batteries is still not sorted out. So it's still about 10 years away mm -hmm. from uh, being a viable option. And during that time, lithium ion batteries will actually be very much even more established than they are now and displacing a, uh, 
uh, established technology is difficult because you have all of this uh, investment in uh, production uh, and also the ecosystem of people working with uh, those batteries. So you have expert engineers, technicians that will be formed to work with the German battery. So what I see here is a, if it happens, a gradual transition towards uh, displacing lithium ion batteries. And I also thought that lithium ion batteries have also a way to go, that's my research. <laughs> so uh, I believe you can uh, improve uh, significantly fast charging, so two or three times faster than we see now for 45 minutes, 30 minutes to maybe uh, 15 minutes to 10 minutes, uh, most likely actually. In terms of energy density, we are right now at uh, about peak uh, what we can do if we don't change uh, the chemistry, but we can also change the, uh, the voltage of the battery uh, to, in, to have more energy. So right now it's 270 watt hour per kilo, kilogram, and it can, I can see that go to in the 300. Uh, finally, cost uh, of lithium ion batteries will go down because of uh, uh, mass adoption. Awesome. Okay, that's good to see that if there's that pathway, you know, the software side and the, and the hardware side are kind of meeting in the middle and I do envision a time when we have uh, cars are common that can go a thousand kilometers on a single charge. Um, I'm just going to end with this question for all of you, 30 seconds max each. Um, how do you see the EV market growing over the next decade um, based on everything we know about policy, state of technology, power grid capability? Um, and then also the publicly shared intentions of automakers and availability of these vehicles. I want to start with Mabel. Um, uh, much faster than we all expect. Um, reliably forecasts of electric vehicle adoption are increased every time they are revised. Um, and, uh, and especially in a, in a sphere of infrastructure and the, s the slow speed at which the grid and utility sector has tended to evolve over the past few decades, it's going to be night and day. Um, and so I think it's, it's important for, for us to look at uh, policy supports and funding as we move through this transition um, and also recognize that uh, we are only one market. And so we want to create a positive and, and welcoming market in Ontario uh, so that we attract the supply, so that we attract the technology. And we already have a great innovation ecosystem here um, certainly for us as a company, the support of Mars and, uh, and that ecosystem has been critical to allow us to create our technology here. Uh, and with our universities, we also have a great strong pool of talent. So there's a lot of opportunity um, for us here to take advantage of this transition. Awesome. Zach, we got the little red light flashing. Yeah. So. Uh, well, very simply, EV adoption uh, follows a logistics curve. Uh, which like more colloquially we might call an exponential curve, but it's actually an S because you can only reach 100%, you can't go above 100%. Uh, we are right in the middle of the ramp up. 10 years from now, we're basically gonna be at saturation. Every new vehicle produced is gonna be electric, except for a few exceptions for specific heavy duty use cases. And you could say this is crazy, like only like five people in this room have EVs today. Um, but you know, in 2007, Steve Ballmer said, you know, who would ever buy a smartphone without a keyboard? And 10 years later, literally every man, woman, and child on the planet has a touchscreen smartphone. Uh, you know, I'm not saying children are going to own their own EVs, but <laughs> <laughs> but everybody's going to have an EV 10 years from now. Awesome, Ivrik. Yes, uh, I tend to agree with this. It's, uh, it's going to take off. Uh, I would put a little pebble <coughs> in, uh, in in the mix here. So I think it depends a lot on policy. So right now uh, we have this uh, policy of banning fossil fuel in 2025. Mm -hmm. uh, if that remains in place, yes, it will take off. But if we have a, m a move from that, like we see in the UK and Germany, uh, we might uh, see a little tapering off, I think. Terrific. Well, the three of you, thank you very much for this conversation. It was great. <laughs> Thank you so much, Tyler, Iverick, Mabel, and Zach. Everybody here has heard Mabel's call, so please reach out, especially the students, if you're interested. At Waterloo, students are our lifeblood, and we're really proud of the talent that we are able to support at the institution and help them grow. So we're going to give a spotlight now on Waterloo. It's our student-led Hyperloop team. 
They took the challenge given by Elon Musk's Hyperloop Alpha paper. And since 2016, this student team has engaged students from across campus to iterate models of University of Waterloo imagined Hyperloop. Max Pochapsky is a student team lead from, Wat from Waterloo, and he, let's get Max to explain and give insight into their work. So I'll turn it over to Max. Yeah, absolutely, it's a pleasure being here. So uh, yeah, we are Waterloo. We are the Hyperloop student design team at the University of Waterloo. In short, we are a group of students passionate about Hyperloop technology and the future of transportation. Now, you might ask yourself, why are students interested in Hyperloop in the first place? Well, to put it simply, it's a sci-fi technology. Uh, it was originally pitched as the fifth mode of transportation. It's more of a hybrid between supersonic flight and high-speed rail, except it's at ground level. Uh, it was originally pitched by Elon Musk uh, in 2013 in his white paper, and then um, our team really found it was actually founded for the SpaceX Hyperloop competition. Uh, the reason Waterloo students were really engaged in this is because uh, a lot of us see Elon Musk as one of the greatest innovators of our time. And of course, this is a chance for us to actually meet with him. <laughs> and so, and so uh, yeah. And because of that, we were actually the first uh, Canadian Hyperloop to compete at SpaceX. Now, this was no easy feat. There were thousands of applicants around the world who applied and we were one of the lucky 15 whose final design was approved to compete at the SpaceX competition in Hawthorne, California. It actually took place at the SpaceX headquarters. Uh, we do have a photo with Elon Musk, but I wasn't able to find it. Um, <laughs> it, it is a prideful memento of our team. So, yeah. Now moving on. Uh, today, we are, um, of course, the SpaceX competitions ended in 2019. I really fell off during COVID since we couldn't meet up in person. But uh, since then, we've continued to provide a fast-paced startup environment uh, for students at the university to innovate in transportation technology and Hyperloop. Now, um, I guess, yeah. So essentially, what we do is, um, our main mission is to bring the world closer together using Hyperloop technology uh, in the sense that Imagine you would be able to work in a major city and live in another. Now, of course, this would solve a little bit of a housing crisis. I know as a student, it's very difficult to find uh, affordable housing. Uh, Hyperloop technology could potentially solve that since you would be able to work in a more or less expensive city whereas, and live in a less expensive neighborhood if it was connected through a sustainable uh, transportation network such as Hyperloop. Uh, now, designing a Hyperloop really is a team effort. Uh, our latest generation uh, Goose 5 pod, uh, we used this at our competition at the Canadian Hyperloop Conference in 2022, uh, required nine core subteams. And each of these subteams needs to work in perfect unison in order to actually achieve the tolerances and requirements of the high speeds that Hyperloops uh, are intended to travel at. Uh, originally, the Hyperloop was pitched to travel at around uh, 1,200 kilometers an hour. Now, of course, uh, that requires all of these subsystems to work well together. Now, in this cool video that we added, uh, you can see the different subcomponents of our Goose 5 pod, uh, including components of our mechanical systems, uh, such as the frame, the stabilizers. Uh, our main source of propulsion, the linear induction motor, which I'm a big fan of since I'm the propulsion lead, um, and the braking system and other electrical subsystems that we weren't able to include. Now, of course, uh, getting all this to work together is, was um, truly a feat because um, you need a wide variety of um, expertise to actually build a new technology that hasn't really been done before. And this is where our diversity really plays in. Uh, we're not just an engineering student design team, we're also a math, science, and arts team. Uh, the arts faculty provides a lot of uh, the operations end because if you can't sell a Hyperloop, you can't build one. Um, Math and science is, of course, needed for the R&D side. And this is actually really interesting because uh, as part of my role as a propulsion subteam lead, I see that if you give like, a mechatronic, like two mechatronics students a problem, they will more or less come up with the same solution. But if you gave the same problem to an engineering student and a physics student, they'll come up with different solutions. 
Now, not one's not worse than the other, but this is sort of where innovation thrives. It's in that interplay between different faculties and ideas. And that's absolutely a necessity when innovating in the transportation space. And we all work together in order to have moments like these. Uh, this is from the Canadian Hyperloop Conference in 2022. Uh, we provide a rich culture for our students to actually innovate and more or less have fun. <laughs> um, yeah. Of course, uh, looking towards the future, we are hoping to compete in Canadian competitions and uh, European and other competitions in the future. And of course, a long-term goal is to become Canada's Hyperloop Technology Research Centre in uh, Waterloo. Now, I added this little <laughs> slide because um, this is about my sub-team. So this term, I asked my team members, what if we could create a subsystem that could provide guidance, propulsion, and levitation? And now I wouldn't be here if you couldn't. So one of our solutions was the transverse flux motor. It is an experimental design that allows us to, um, long story short, uh, generally speaking, if you want guidance, like if you have a levitating pod and you want guidance, you generally need a computer to tell you where you have to like uh, move the pod. Uh, these transverse flux motors actually are self-orienting. So uh, in the demo we have above, the aluminum sheet, if displaced, will actually recenter itself above the motor. And of course, uh, this is an energized rail demo. Uh, in the future, we're planning to invert it and use that as part of our um, linear induction motor system. This is actually an interactive demo. Uh, for those of you who are interested, you are free. You are welcome to come play with it at our booth. Um, yeah. And our second solution to uh, this electromagnetic thrust vectoring uh, pro question was the electrodynamic wheel. Now, this is a tried and tested uh, technology. They use uh, permanent magnets arranged in a hallback configuration, which essentially means you have a strong magnetic field on one end and a very weak magnetic field on the other. And by rotating these wheels really, really uh, quickly, you're actually able to generate eddy currents within aluminum and create a sort of uh, levitative force. And by actually vectoring these wheels, you're able to sort of rotate and move and translate the pod. Uh, this is also an interactive demo. Um, and for those of you, again, for those of you who are interested, uh, feel free to come down to our booth and uh, play around with it. Uh, so thank you guys for hosting us. But before I go, I did want to mention that um, a lot of these student design teams, we thrive off of competitions and sponsorships from uh, leaders in industry. And so we'd really appreciate funding for uh, newer <laughs> <laughs> competitions and uh, experiences for our teams. So thank you for hosting. We're really excited to see what you and your teammates are going to accomplish over the competitions in the next couple of years. This brings us to our morning networking break. Um, networking is really important. Uh, you can all follow the schedule and see that we are a bit behind. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to shorten one of the sessions this after the break, but still give you some time to network. So I'll ask you uh, to enjoy your uh, discussions, maybe visit Max booth, and be back here at 10.50, if we can all be back at the tables at 10.50, or just a, a minute or two before. Sure. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I'm Remy, and I uh, work with Pentonium. And what we're doing is we're working to really try and solve one of the more challenging problems in public transit, which is, empty buses driving around in circles. We all know public transit works really well in dense cities like London or even parts of downtown Toronto, but as soon as we go into less dense areas, it is inefficient and also inconvenient. And we see that in the numbers. Now, across North America on average, about 5% of people use public transit for their daily commute. 84% use personal cars. And that's a sustainability problem. And we all know about 30% of emissions come from transportation, and a big majority of that is from passenger transportation. So if we're to improve on our sustainability and emissions, we need to find ways to, find, to attract more people to use public transit. And that's what we did. We, we, we wanted to improve the way fixed routes work, and improve the way inefficient fixed routes and develop a system. So in 2018, we deployed our technology 
to a city in Ontario, Belleville, Ontario, and within 80 days, we were able to increase public transit ridership by over 300%. Since then, we've deployed our technology to dozens of cities across North America and moved millions of riders and reduced GHG emissions in each of those cities by over 100,000. Um, so how does on-demand work? Um, so the key in what we do is we first capture the demand. The most simple way is through a mobile application. People tell us where they're going, from which stop to which stop. We then look at all the vehicles, all the buses in the network, and we calculate what is the most cost-effective way for these buses to service that demand, taking into account this, the capacity of the vehicles, how many people in the vehicles, where people are going, how long they've been in the vehicle for, and we're calculating millions of calculations every millisecond and guiding these buses between bus stops, one stop at a time, and adjusting based on any of that feedback. And you may say, look at me and say, hey, Remy, this sounds a lot like Uber or, or transit uh, or taxi service. Um, but really, the key difference between what we do is we try and look at it from a macro level, from a global uh, perspective, as opposed to some of other on-demand solutions or uh, Uber-type solutions, which look at it at a more local, micro level. And what happens is when you do that is you, you see the results in the, in the numbers and the efficiency. So on average, other on-demand type services move about one to three people per hour in a vehicle, whereas in the cities that we've deployed in, we're moving 10 to 25 people per hour in a vehicle. And this really makes a business case for on-demand to be applicable in many different use cases. Um, so let me tell you a familiar story. Um, Fort Erie, which is a town uh, just near Niagara, and they faced similar challenges as a lot of places in North America. They had about 5% of people were using their transit. They operated on a fixed route service. In the pandemic, they decided they wanted to change things up and they reached out to us and we put in our system there and people could then get anywhere in the city on one bus. They didn't have to change buses. And people who didn't use public transit before because it was inconvenient for their schedule started using it to go uh, on a daily basis where they needed to go. So we were able to move that public transit mode shift from 5% to 15% of the people who use public transit in the city. And it was so successful that the US Department of Energy did a study on this deployment. And they found that we were able to reduce the GHG per ride from the previous fixed route service to now this new service by up to by almost 60% while providing a more convenient service. And they said that if this was to apply to 271 similar type uh, cities in the US, that would be about 3.8 million tons of GHG reduction per year. So there are thousands of similar cities to Fort Erie in North America and thousands more across Europe and in the world. Um, so we believe our technology can really help cities in their energy transition immediately uh, improve that now and also help cities provide a more equitable, sustainable, and fun public transit system. So thank you very much. All right, next up we have Jeremy Wang. Jeremy is the co-founder and COO of Ribbit, a venture-backed startup that helps cargo airlines deliver better service and access new markets via fleets of small self-flying airplanes. Ribbit is credited with the first fully automated gate-to-gate -gate flight in Canada and will soon be bringing commercial routes online in collaboration with regulators, communities, and customers. Jeremy, welcome. You got me on the timer, so I'm going to go quick. Um, rather than telling you about the amazing potential that autonomy has, I want to start with a market that we often overlook. Um, across northern Canada, there's about 120 or so remote, predominantly First Nations and Inuit communities that have no year-round road access. The only way in or out, be it medicine, food, or people, is by plane. And on any given year, about 120 million pounds of food gets flown in. 
Uh, that's a map of most of these communities. Actually, just last night, I flew back from Thompson. Has anyone here been to Thompson, Manitoba? Just by a show of hands, no? So, so the way to think about Thompson is Winnipeg is about a couple hundred kilometers north of Toronto, and then Thompson is an 800 kilometer road trip north of Winnipeg, and Thompson is considered the southernmost hub for northern communities in Manitoba. So I hope that provides a, a bit of perspective. And in the average community in the north, where again, basically the only way in or out is by plane, uh, most planes resupply stores or resupply the community on a basis of one time per week. And that's on paper. In practice, you have weather issues, you have maintenance issues, stuff happens. And in reality, it's two to three weeks that most of these communities get supplied. And what does that do to the supply chain? That means you have to have more inventory. You have to have bigger warehousing facilities. It adds a lot of cost and a lot of really unpredictability to the supply chain. So my co-founder, Carl, who's also sitting here in the audience today, we started Ribbit three years ago, really interested in trying to address this question of inequity in transportation, the social sustainability pillar that Dr. Kearns talked about earlier. And what we did in 2020 was that we bought our first plane. This is a, a small two-seater ultralight aircraft. Believe it or not, we got it for about $10,000 secondhand. And then we added a whole bunch of sensors and autonomy and all the things you'd expect to find in self-driving cars onto this aircraft. And luckily, my co-founder is a pilot. So I don't have to be the person inside the plane, it's actually him. And in fact, you'll see him sitting in the front there. So what we do is we take this plane and we fly it around and it actually does the taxiing, the takeoffs, the landings. It'll avoid other aircraft. There's a radar in the front of the aircraft as well as transponders that interact with other airplanes. And we've done about 150 hours or so of flight testing so far, all of this together with Transport Canada. And our expectation is that in about uh, 12 months from now, we'll, we hope to be the first company in the world to do a commercial revenue generating flight uh, with, an, with a true airplane that has no pilot inside it. Let's see here. <laughs> well, it hasn't happened yet. <laughs> And really in the future, the goal is to move beyond two-seater aircraft, where we feel you know, the sweet spot is, is uh, airplanes like you see like this. So we're not talking about 737s or you know, really large jet aircraft. We're talking about small six to 12-seater planes that could really make a difference in regional markets and rural and remote markets, where today you could essentially, you know, uh, where today essentially the alternative is, is quite poor in terms of service levels, and where we hope to both open up new markets as well as improve the flight frequency and options there. Uh, and of course, as an engineer, we do this because we love technology, um, but we also you know, need to think about the business side. So actually, in the first three months of the business, we just went out and talked to about 200 people. We talked to people in the communities, community leaders, regulators, everybody, um, and we ended up signing six LOIs worth about 42 million a year. To give you a sense, the 120 million pounds of food that gets shipped in every year, uh, companies typically pay about 200 to 300 million dollars a year to ship up north, uh, so we feel like uh, you know, we're making some pretty good progress on that front. Uh, and we also have approvals from Transport Canada to flight test this aircraft without anybody inside. Um, so we're really excited to be a, you know, a proud Canadian company that's doing that. And our hope is that if we can nail this in northern Canada, there's actually regions all around the world that suffer from poor access to transportation. This is a, a map that was published uh, in Nature Journal that's also been picked up by a whole bunch of you know, World Bank and others um, that gives you a kind of a heat map of travel time to the nearest major city. And close to 700 million people around the world still live about five to six hours away from the fastest mode of transportation to the nearest major hub. So if you're thinking about you know, e-commerce, any of the things that we take for granted living in a large city, you just don't have that in these regions. And this represents uh, basically a huge underserved market for us that we hope to tackle. Um, you know, thinking about Thompson again, that's about a six hour drive from Winnipeg, but it's not a drive that people even choose to make because the only gas station is about midway through there, and we talked to a, uh, a store owner that essentially got stranded at that gas station. The power was out, they expected to refuel, and even with road access, without the other infrastructure that comes with that, sometimes air transportation is the only way in or out. So our hope is that with Ribbit, we can make transportation accessible to everybody. Thanks. Last but not least, we have Ryan Jansen. Ryan is the co-founder and CTO of Transpod, a Canadian company designing the next generation 
of ultra-high-speed aerospace vehicles to move passengers and cargo between cities at more than 1,000 kilometers an hour. Ryan is the chief architect of the multi-billion dollar future system, which includes transportation infrastructure, operations, aerodynamics, and propulsion. Welcome, Ryan. Well, thank you all, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here and see all of the great uh, uh, researchers and innovators out there, uh, so thank you very much. And I'd really like to uh, engage with all of you in your inner passion to, to really contribute something. And what we're trying to do is, is, is really be that to the world, uh, the, the next great kind of Canadian story of a, a massive uh, impact worldwide, kind of like the next Canada. This is a very big project, uh, but basically we have introduced a new type of vehicle that we call the flux jet. And it's kind of like an aircraft without wings uh, and uh, running between cities. So we're carrying, it's basically a mass transportation system. And uh, really working at that scale, uh, we're engaging with uh, the aerospace industry, uh, railway industry, uh, universities, uh, industrial partners around the world, and the construction industry. So it's, a, it's definitely a, a, a big uh, project uh, that's happening right now. Uh, we have uh, a large, uh, we've signed an MOU with the Alberta government, so for, for a project between uh, Edmonton and Calgary, so that would be a transpod line where we've uh, secured the initial phase one funding right now. And uh, so this is, this is really, uh, for me this is really exciting, uh, just to have an opportunity to come up with something that really is thinking different, uh, thinking about aircraft, but at sort of a ground level. And you see there this flux jet where our stations are a little bit like a uh, train station. Uh, but then it can actually uh, reach high speeds. So this is partly addressing a need for um, even local connectivity inside cities and also high speed, uh, connecting airports, connecting different regional stations and so on. So what are we, well, uh, basically this, uh, building this transpod line, it's kind of a married pair between this flux jet vehicle that we've uh, been designing in uh, Canada uh, and the infrastructure. Uh, so this, this transpod line. And so it's, it's, a, it's a very um, a big project, but the key is uh, really designing something from the ground up that addresses a big need. And uh, if you compare to um, one of the challenges with electric aircraft and electric cars where we need uh, batteries, and, and, uh, and so there's, there's a lot of great work being done on that. When we uh, are accelerating to uh, the speed of an aircraft. When you think about the number of um, gigajoules of, of energy stored on board, uh, for us, uh, with safety concerns, we actually have some pretty interesting uh, new technology to deal with that, and I'll, I'll show you that. So first, uh, I'm that guy, uh, so I'm Ryan. And so my background is in partly the research world, Silicon Valley, and coming up with some new innovations. And so this is really a, a, a labor of uh, passion, of love, about uh, you know, designing something that can have a big impact. As a company, uh, so we've been just starting up for a few years now, and so we have, uh, some of our work is in France, uh, Northern Italy, uh, a little bit in Switzerland, uh, definitely a few places in Canada with uh, some American partners, British partners, uh, to really get this done. And so uh, we've secured that uh, first phase funding, funding in Alberta, but then there's also just the overall uh, engineering of this system. It's not something that is, we're going to finish tomorrow, but it's a really long term, kind of like developing a new uh, an Airbus or, or, um, or Boeing develop a new aircraft. It's, it's definitely a long term thing. Uh, and then working with a few different uh, locations uh, to, to create that, not just in Canada. I'll show you. And so what you see there, this is actually a fully electrically powered system. So it's linked up with the grid. And when you look at those uh, uh, things sticking out, those four things, those are kind of engines. They're, those are uh, 
electrically powered, and they create a kind of little wave motion in magnetic field, and that creates a, a, a force to go forward. And so what we're able to do is running this a little bit like a train, we're actually able to operate it like an aircraft where it can actually bank into a turn and make it uh, really practical for, for just a smooth ride for passengers, like when you're on a plane, uh, but actually able to uh, stabilize it with some of the technology that we have to, to make that work. But um, one, of the, um, one of the most interesting things is by saving on, by not having batteries on board, one of the technologies we have is uh, we're using plasma to get power to the vehicles from the grid. So we have the grid going to power rails. It picks up the power, but when you have a lot of trains, um, when they have, you know, in, in Europe or, or Asia, you have a, a power pickup system that can wear out at high speed. And, uh, and so we have this new system that uses plasma to make that work. So, uh, so it's, it's definitely a, a very interesting project, uh, but really the environmental benefits, uh, sustainability, uh, and really on the innovation side. Um, and so far, uh, we're working on a test track. Uh, construction has started in France, uh, and you, you see some of the digging there. Uh, and our final test track is going to be in Alberta. Uh, we also unveiled uh, a, a demonstrator of how our system works. So it's really, uh, it's really a big project on the engineering of that system, but also working with uh, things like the government of Alberta uh, and financial partners to, uh, to make this work. There are a few other locations we can get into right now, but, uh, but that's also with the regulatory side. All of this has to be paid attention to, but really designing it with safety and regula regulatability, <laughs> regulability <laughs> uh, for the long term. So, uh, so definitely uh, it's a multi-year project, uh, working with those regulators, uh, working with many different partners at the same time. And, uh, and really it's, it's, it's exciting to just get this uh, FlexJet uh, project on the, off the ground and, uh, and working on a transpod line. Uh, so thank you, and we can get into questions after. <laughs> all right, so let's dig into it and have a little bit of a discussion here. Um, you're all transit innovators, but you're also entrepreneurs running your own startups, your own businesses. What has been one of the biggest challenges in taking your ideas, scaling them up, and commercializing them? Uh, Remy, let's start with you. Um, yeah, I mean, for us, the biggest challenge is we work uh, with municipalities. Uh, generally, sales cycles are long with municipalities. They're not really designed so much for innovative products, uh, more risk averse. And as a, as a small company with limited resources, that can be challenging how you navigate that. Um, so, you know, that's, that's been our, our challenge. Um, but, you know, as we're going along, we're getting, you know, more use cases, more results being published, um, and that's really helping us. And, you know, we believe this is going to be the next, you know, where transportation has to go in public transit, but it's being able to manage that time and, and that, resources just to get to that point. Of course, and Jeremy, how about you? Yeah, well, maybe I'll start by um, addressing that uh, I think one of the challenges we expected going into this was regulatory issues, but actually Transport Canada has been very, very supportive, so we're quite pleased about that. Um, I will say, though, that you know, being in Canada, uh, the appetite for startups tends to be more software startups, and so you know, when you're building an autonomous aircraft, it's a little bit, you don't, you don't have the luxury of, you know, building a piece of code, tweaking it, testing it, tweaking it, testing it. Um, you kind of have to know what you're going to do, build it, fly it, make sure it works, uh, and then go from there. So you have to be very deliberate and capital efficient in doing all of our testing, um, but also getting people excited about something that it has a lot of potential, but it's also going to take a lot of money to get there. Right. Ryan, we heard about your projects that are happening right now. What's been one of um, the challenges of scaling up? Uh, I would, well, on one side, I would definitely echo that. Uh, building hardware at a very large scale, uh, that's, that's a really interesting topic and a big challenge uh, when you're talking about um, 
uh, the funding side, and that's that's actually really honed, I would say, our honed our skills and our approach over the years because we started out applying for different grants, and there, there's 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 so much uh, uh, funding out there for for new uh, innovation, of course, but. Uh, there, there's so much of a need to have, okay, are we, are we selling something right now? Are we selling some widget right now or selling software, like you said? Uh, and so for TransPod, we, it really honed our, um, our, our approach to designing something from the ground up, holistically, that, that is not just saying, okay, let's design something that works with the physics and then have someone else get the business case working and then have someone else figure out a way to plunk it in a city. <laughs> uh, but really it has to be designed holistically to be a beautiful solution that addresses all of those things at once. And that's really what forced us to have a, a, a really profound business case. Uh, and that's really led to, uh, so those challenges led to where we can have something that can attract funding from the private sector. And jumping off that, Remy, how do you balance business development with sustainable outcomes and social good? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think that's a key. Like for us, it's kind of central to what we do is that social good. I think public transit is uh, you know, full of the social good. And having that as sort of the central uh, ethos of what we're doing and trying to improve that to improve, uh, it, allow people to get to jobs more easily. That's really been sort of the backbone of what we've done. And so it makes business development, um, you know, there doesn't seem to be a conflict there because you know, we want to get this out to more municipalities because we believe it's gonna help people from a social, from a, a environmental, sustainable aspect and just improve the way a system that's been working well for a long time but make it better and uh, advance it. So it, for us, we find it's, it's easy to balance that. It's more the challenge of how do we get them to move faster? Right. Um, and um, yeah, that's, the, that's from our perspective. Jeremy, how about you? Um, I'm reminded of, uh, I guess, this, this phenomenon that occurs. It's called like Jevons, I believe it's Jevons Paradox, where essentially when businesses do find efficiencies, particularly when it relates to sustainability, they then eat into that margin and you don't actually see a net decrease on the overall aspect. So within aviation, I'm kind of embarrassed to say that like over the last 50 years, um, the amount of fuel consumed per person mile flown has decreased by about 40%. But if you look at the overall industry as a whole, you know, emissions have basically been creeping up still. So even though I was thinking about this morning, you know, we're talking about how it's not just gonna be following what we're already doing from an operation perspective, uh, it's going to take innovation to really unlock some of these sustainability improvements. It's also going to take more than that because, uh, quite frankly, you know, autonomy, even with electricity, is going to have to do more than just you know, reinvent the technology and really rethink the business models, the policy. The entire system really has to be um, disrupted, I guess. Mm -hmm. yeah. Ryan, what do you want to add to that? Okay, well, I, I, when you asked about how do you balance those things, I think uh, it really has to be fundamentally designed from the outset, and that's that's when you have that when you're founding a company or doing some new design, it has to be really baked in at its core, the the social good, uh, and for me that's kind of three pillars. So uh, trying to have some solution that is with radically breakthrough technology or using some kind of breakthrough technology, uh, and then has environmental benefits at least for us, um, and also can. Uh, address people's needs. So for us, it's, it's moving people very fast uh, and, and addressing kind of congestion needs too. Um, and so the, the, you have to really have some really uh, beautiful solution that can satisfy those. But then when you actually put it somewhere, uh, so take an example of Alberta, if, if you're, you're planning a line with the government and the private sector between Calgary and Edmonton, uh, we have really taken approach of engaging with different communities uh, early on, uh, really early on, because sometimes when transportation corridors are planned, there's an authority that that says from on high, you know, this is the best route and that's it, and 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 and, and go with it. Uh, we've been uh, 
in pretty good discussions with uh, different uh, indigenous communities. So several of the First Nations uh, in Alberta, uh, where it's um, very early on. And there's even, it, it's, it's really positive and productive discussions there where it can even be ev even uh, different uh, investments where there, there is actually interest uh, in, in the project and being a really close stakeholder of that kind of project. So you have to, you have, to have benefits for uh, for people on a, on, a, on a local scale and also address uh, mass need. Remy, you touched upon this a little bit in your last answer, but obviously there's a huge push in Canada as well as globally to find more sustainable solutions and to really get to a place where we're reducing our climate impact. Um, are we moving fast enough though to support companies like yours um, that really want to move the needle? You know, I, I, th I think we're doing a, a, a good effort, but uh, yeah, I think you can always do better. I mean, for us, you know, I, c I can speak from our perspective. So in our perspective, you know, we work in an industry that's probably not the flashiest industry. Um, <laughs> that, you know, if you, I was listening to the panel before and you know, we were talking about electrification and there is a lot of policy now towards electrification and you know, I think that's great. I think we need lots of different solutions. Um, but for our perspective, you know, where we see public transit being an important solution as well, sometimes we feel these <coughs> industries which have worked well are forgotten with sort of these new silver industries. And I think it, sh it should, when we look at these and look at policy and funding around that, we should look at it for a holistic approach because new solutions are great, but also there are solutions which are there that have worked for some time, but we can improve them and make them better. Uh, we can apply technology to that to, to really make it better and uh, move, move ahead. Um, yeah, who wants to wait 40 minutes for the bus, right? We have to make it more efficient. Uh, Jeremy, what about you? Um, I, 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 again, I'm thinking back to some comments from this morning too that you know, I think to really you know, continue building this lead that we have in the ecosystem here, we need to have Canadian entrepreneurs and VCs in the entire ecosystem wanting to stay here, even for those really big moonshot ideas. And I think as much as there have been great examples within Canada, there's also this huge temptation to go to the States, whether it's as a founder or as an employee looking for you know, the next big thing to work on. Um, so certainly for us at Rivet, we hope that you know, we can be part of that push to, to stay in Canada. We have a market here. We have you know, everything we need really to succeed. Uh, but uh, you know, it's really, I think, a, a collective effort to, to keep things here. Ryan will. Wrap okay. it up with your thoughts here. Yeah. Well, you know, just to, just to wrap up, I, I, uh, I would definitely say with moving fast, uh, we, we have to, I, I really love the, the, the different approaches with you guys uh, because there's different types of transportation systems and coming in with a transport line, uh, my approach is, is definitely not to uh, uh, say, okay, this is going to replace everything else, but more to complement and, uh, and really integrate in a wider transportation network. Because you definitely, I'm a firm believer in uh, public transportation, uh, whether it's, whether it's at a, a, a very huge long distance scale, uh, like the transport line, but also connecting with a finer mesh of, 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 of public transportation, connecting at airports uh, to, to uh, overseas air travel, so all of those, Things come together, um, and, and so I think. Oops, I think we need to. I think we need to move fast. Uh, one of the things with with benefiting society is um, is is really quickly addressing the needs across Canada, U.S., elsewhere of people being uh, converted over to using mass transportation systems in a way that's more sustainable, uh, and in the way that our cities are built uh, so that they are built with the right kind of density, the right kind of uh, intensity to make that sustainable built environment uh, a work. And, and, and moving fast is also finding the right people, the right uh, the really innovative people from around the world, researchers and so on. That's, that's what we're trying to do, but we, again, we need to move fast. <laughs> thank you all so much. It was a pleasure speaking with you and thank you everyone for, for attending. It's not easy working in this field and 
trying to advance sustainable transportation and being an entrepreneur trying to find funds. I think, can we just uh, give another round of applause to Remy, Jeremy, and Ryan for pushing this work? And finally, I'd like to introduce our last panel. Um, we've got innovators, thought leaders in uh, uh, academics who are working in sustainable transportation. Through some recent discussions with our president, Vivek Gaul, and also with um, our Mars leader, it's very, very clear that we can't do anything without we can take all the innovations, and we can talk about small impact and local impact, but in order to make bigger impact, we really need to think hard about knowledge mobilization. And that involves what are the stumbling blocks towards policy? How can we work towards moving these uh, stumbling blocks? Not only policy, but infrastructure considerations. So our moderator for this panel is Jesse Marr. Jesse is a professor at an Ontario Research Chair in Sustainability Energy at the University of Waterloo. She's in the Department of Systems Design Engineering and also the School of Environment, Enterprise and Development. Prior to joining Waterloo, Jesse spent two decades in the Ontario electricity sector. Please welcome Jesse. about aviation, about electric vehicles, about innovation, and to talk to our, our panel of sustainable transportation <coughs> experts um, about very cons important considerations beyond technology, important things like infrastructure, uh, policy, planning. Um, this is something that University of Waterloo also excels at beyond oh. technology. Um, for each of our three panelists, uh, you'll find lengthier bios for each of them in, on the website, but very quickly, I will introduce them. We have uh, Dr. Lisa Altman Hall, who is a professor and the chair of the Systems Design Engineering Department, my home department, at the University of Waterloo. Professor Altman Hall's research focuses on transportation systems, especially methods to collect unique databases for modeling and analysis of long distance travel, transportation sector emissions, network resiliency, streetscape design, and non-motorized transportation. So welcome, Lisa. Thank you. Uh, we have Dr. De Jeff Casello, who is the Associate Vice President of Graduate and Postdoctoral Affairs, and also a professor in the School of Planning at the University of Waterloo, of course. Uh, professor Casello's interests lie in urban transportation systems and their impacts on healthy and economically viable urban areas. Looking forward to hearing what you have to say, Jeff. Thanks so much. And we also have Dr. Marcus Moos, who is a professor and the director of the School of Planning at the University of Waterloo. Uh, taking a highly interdisciplinary approach, Professor Moos' research is on changing economies, social structures, uh, transportation patterns, and housing markets of our communities from a sustainability and equity perspective. So uh, welcome, Marcus. Okay, so we don't have a lot of time for our panel today, so we're gonna go through things very quickly. For today's session, we'll start by getting some quick reflections from each of our three panelists on uh, all the wonderful and inspiring ideas that we've heard so far today. Then we'll uh, talk about a systems approach with uh, Jeff anchoring uh, that part. And then we'll talk about uh, things like housing, land use, and equity, and that part will be led by Marcus. And last, we'll talk about free and intercity uh, issues with Lisa, and then we'll, we'll wrap things up. So uh, first, maybe we'll start with Jeff and then go to Lisa and, and Marcus. Um, if you could each tell us something noteworthy that you, you heard this morning and, and maybe your quick reflections on that. Yeah, thanks, and um, I think maybe the, the thing that I was most moved by this morning was this notion that we are here and we are um, borrowing this land from the next generation and borrowing community and borrowing society and borrowing this environment. And, we all have such a responsibility to move in directions that we've talked so much about today. And certainly the technology and all the innovation that we've heard about is, is one pathway to the goal of 
the sustainable outcome. Um, I think where we'll go in this panel, I hope, is to think more about uh, the diversity of approaches that we can take, uh, technological being one of them, but there's a whole host of things I think that we need to think carefully about to achieve our sustainability outcomes. So um, this idea of, of our commitment to the next generation is really what guides, uh, what I took away from this morning and the pathways that technology share. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. Lisa? Um, I guess the thing that strikes me about the summit, you know, I'm a diehard cyclist. I've stubbed tires on my bike, and um, it's so exciting, especially young students. They want to talk about modeling transportation in cities and our day-to-day -day travel. And I, I think one of the things I really loved about the summit this morning was that we um, explicitly included uh, both long-distance intercity travel, both those that remote access that Jeremy talked about, but also flying um, between global hubs in Asia and Canada, wherever it is. And uh, we also uh, made mention of freight. And so uh, two numbers you can sort of take home, they're approximate numbers <coughs> because they vary everywhere, is about 40% of transportation's emissions is inner city. It's not your daily commute, whether or not you're on your bike, it's inner city. I kind of kill my carbon footprint when I get on the airplane, right? Um, and then the other number you can remember is 40% about 40% of the carbon emissions in the transportation sector is actually freight. And so don't just think about the big trucks on the 401 um, or the ships burning bunker fuel in the oceans. Um, also think about um, your Amazon packages. So, so I loved that this summit included inner city travel and freight and wasn't just about uh, our day-to-day -day commute. Yeah, thanks Lisa. We'll, we'll talk about uh, a bit more about the, uh, those issues uh, in a couple minutes as well. Uh, Marcus? Yeah, thank you. It's been really fascinating to hear all the different scales of transportation innovations. And I think I was particularly struck by the ways uh, many of the people spoke about the need for technology to change in line with policy and governance. And ultimately, you know, technological adoption is a factor of what society does economically, politically, and how we organize ourselves. Um, and so ultimately, we have to do that in conjunction with technological progress. Um, the other one that, that struck me is sort of this idea of different types of technologies, and you know I'm always struck by by the bicycle in some ways <laughs> because it's it's still one of the most efficient ways to get around, um, and you know it's not that exciting to talk about a bicycle in some circles, um, but it, it sort of makes one think about you know what technology. Well, in our circles, it is right. <laughs> I don't know, I'm trying to be self <laughs> um, It uh, yeah, makes one think about you know technological progress sometimes, and this has happened in history too, sometimes great progress is made by looking at what has been done in the past in a more efficient way. And sometimes you want to reinvent the wheel, I guess. Yeah, thank you, Marcus. So uh, Jeff, let, let's talk about the systems approach. And, and you did mention this a bit earlier in your sure. opening remarks. Um, but we do need to go beyond um, just a technological revolution. Mm -hmm. We can't rely solely on that. Can you, can you tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, I always like to start with principles. And if you think about the principles of sustainable transportation, I think ultimately what we want to be able to do is we want to be, remain connected, I think, as Vivek was talking about this morning. Um, not all of us enjoyed staying home in our, in our living rooms. Having human interaction and having economic activity, this is what society is doing. And so we start with the principle that we want to move, we want to move goods, we want to move each other, we want to interact. The next principle is that we want to do that with as little a footprint as we can. And so we begin with human power, which is really the very best way for us to move. Um, if we walk or we cycle, there is very little carbon footprint that's associated with that. There's very limited boundaries of how far we can get with walking and cycling. And so then we move to this idea of mechanical energy to, to move us. And the principle, the next principle is we ought to choose the mechanical energy that is right and is producing the least impact um, for our movements. And we ought to try to reduce the amount of mechanical energy per person. And so you can think about electric vehicles and you can think about electricity as really reducing the point of travel emissions. So all of us in the city aren't, aren't feeling the emissions of an electric vehicle when it's operating. But there's still a life cycle of creating that electric vehicle and creating the, the infrastructure on which that electric vehicle is operating. And if you sum all that up, you'll see that that's a solution that's moving us in the right direction, but doesn't get us all the way. And then you start to think about shared electric vehicles. And all of a sudden now, not everybody has an electric vehicle. And the amount of energy that goes into creating the electric vehicle and the inputs become much less. 
And there's a really good example of a shared electric vehicle that is right out here. Um, it's called the subway. It, it carries, uh, each train carries 2,400 people. We can run 20 of them an hour without much trouble. So you can move 50,000 people up and down Young and University Avenues in, in Toronto with your electric vehicles. And so let's not, as Marcus was saying, let's not lose sight of the idea that we have very good, very high movement intensity with very low mechanical energy um, solutions already for us. So I just wanted to set the principles so we can have a conversation about how do we move and what roles the technology play as we move forward, thinking more about this holistic system of, of transportation. Yeah. yeah, thanks Jeff. I took the subway here this morning. <laughs> Very nice ride. Um, Marcus, um, uh, building on that, um, uh, your research looks a bit more at, you know, why, why are we uh, moving around with things like housing and uh, the, the different uh, motivation behind it? Uh, can you tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, um, it's a good question. Right? Ultimately, we travel for various reasons. Um, we go to work, we go to school, we visit friends, we go on trips, and some of those are more discretionary than others. And so thinking about you know, which trips you want to influence uh, makes a big difference too. And that work from work and home trip is still definitely one of the main ones in terms of our daily activities. But as others have said, the carbon impact is particularly large for intercity travel, right? So one has to sort of strike that balance. Um, I think when we're thinking about um, you know, transportation technology, I think it's important to remember too that that in itself, of course, affects land values. Um, and so that sort of then speaks for me, yes, to the economics of it, but it also speaks to then who has access to be proximate to that technology. When we think of a technology, for instance, becoming, you know, allowing us to spread out to reduce housing costs, that may not necessarily play out because th that technology is not going to be even across geography. It's going to have particular points where you're going to be able to access it. Uh, and those points are going to see land value uplifts. Uh, and then you're going to you know, sort of redo, re reintroduce the cycle of what often is referred to as gentrification, where lower income earners have trouble accessing the most efficient uh, transportation technologies. And we see that in cities today, right? There's um, um, lots of neighborhoods that have lots of transportation options available to people. Some, you know, some of the downtown neighborhoods here, you can take the subway, the streetcar, you can take an Uber, you can bike, you can walk. Um, but those locations also come with particular housing costs. Uh, and so we can't think about transportation in isolation of the cost it takes to actually access that um, location. So that, those are some of the things I would urge us to think about. What kind of new mobility are we creating and how are we shaping the land values? And what does that mean for who can access? Yeah, those are excellent points. And um, maybe Lisa, we can talk about um, intercity because there, there's moving within um, different neighborhoods, but also uh, between cities. Uh, you mentioned that earlier too. Can you tell us a bit more about that, please? Yeah, so it's interesting if we're all thinking about Marcus talking about the complexity of what's really involved in a transportation system within the city and the equity of housing and housing costs and, and really ultimately the, the, the number, the amount of energy you need is, is dependent on the distance between that origin and destination. And we're really kind of ahead of the game on passenger travel, especially within city, because we kind of know that the, we're going to electrify the passenger fleet. We're going to electrify the bicycles and the scooters mm -hmm. and the cars um, and, and the buses uh, that we talked about in the last panel. But for freight and inner city travel, we're even further behind on figuring out how that, that sort of future complex system is really going to operate. And I like today that we've sort of um, kind of like said, so you sort of said, let's be really innovative. Let's think about using technology the best way we can with policy and behavior change. Like we've got to really think outside the box. But if you think about it, airplanes are airplanes with lots of people in them, not, not the smaller ones, are really dependent on liquid fuel. And I think there's a lot of entities um, talking about things like sustainable aviation fuel as though it's, it's where we're going. And there's a couple of really good pilots um, Worldwide using sustainable aviation fuel, but it, it's not clear how the supply chain for that fuel is really going to be work or be realistic or the, the life cycle uh, mm -hmm. footprint of that sustainable aviation fuel. So we've got to think about uh, aviation in a very different way. I think aviation is a very special thing. I believe, Suzanne, it connects the world. It's an important part of our global society. And so we need to say, as a global society, are we going to save some of the petroleum-based fuel? 
Are we going to save and use some of our carbon emissions because of the importance of aviation? And that begs the question of, well, which aviation trips do we most need and what do we get? How do we measure the cost and benefit of, of those trips? And, and what intercity travel can we push to the ground? The, the sort of robo-coaches, we sometimes call them in my field, you know, the electric mm -hmm. large vehicles. And maybe airports play a role as the hub where you get on your, your electric autonomous a robo-coach and, and go from city to city. <laughs> uh, the same is true in, in freight. I mean, we need a lot of energy to do construction, to uh, make a ship go, uh, to even make a tractor trailer go. And it, it's not clear um, how we're gonna do that. You know, there's talk about hydrogen, hydrogen fuel cell, uh, even things like methanol potentially in ships, but all the port infrastructure to make sure the ships um, can get the fuel wherever they go, that kind of makes the where we put the charging stations for EVs look like a simple problem, mm -hmm. to, just to be <laughs> honest about it. Um, I do think there's a really cool thing uh, between Toronto and Montreal related to freight in that we, we could potentially have a catenary line to electrify uh, a truck fleet in that corridor. It happens to be a corridor where the development might work. If we think about places like uh, Arizona or California where there's these long uh, truck corridors, they don't necessarily have electricity out along those interstate systems. Mm -hmm. So we actually don't even have electricity in the places where we might want to electrify the freight line. So anyway, <coughs> complexity all over the place, Jesse. Uh, Jesse, yes. can, can I just yes, add one, one thing just yes. quickly to say? The other element that we haven't talked a lot about today is the economic signals that society sends to our travel behavior. Mm -hmm. So many of us can go out and really honestly in North America get into our single occupant automobile for very low cost and travel very long distances at, at a very low expense. And if you compare the way that we spend on transportation, single occupant automobile, compared to the rest of the world, it's a very different economic signal. And when the city of Toronto attempted to impose charges on traveling by automobile through the urban core, the province disallowed that. So I think we have this problem where we have for eight decades or more, underpriced our transportation system and not ask people to really evaluate their environmental impacts of their behavior. And this is an outcome I think that if we're going to think systematically, we have to get to. Maybe I'll pick up, yeah. <laughs> um, picking up on that, but maybe bringing it back to the land use question then as well. And I think, you know, there's, there's a clear connection between land use and transportation, as many of us can appreciate. And I think, you know, by subsidizing particular modes of transportation, particularly the individual single occupancy vehicle, I call it single occupancy vehicle, there's usually only one person in it, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that, of course, has contributed a lot to the sprawling of our cities. When it's very easy to get around, um, uh, you can sprawl out more, right? Um, I, I always, in these conversations, when I throw in, like, you know, I, I drive. I actually kind of love driving from a perspective of being able to go. So this is Ooh, not, but, yeah. right? So I feel like you've got to kind of, kind of this admission that like the individual mobility that and the freedom that it gives us, that that's why people do it. And we have to kind of understand that to appreciate, oh, this is why it's so difficult to change. But when you do look at countries that have invested significantly in alternative transportation system and subsidized the systems that are more sustainable from a carbon pr um, perspective, do you do see the switch. And so I think, you know, it's throughout the day today, I've heard question, uh, comments around, well, transportation, and public transportation isn't always efficient. I fully agree, it's not efficient in most of North America. Well, there are many parts of the world where it actually is with current technology. So I think lots is possible by changing the economic signals and recognizing what we subsidize as a society is ultimately the choice framework that people operate within, right? People have choice, but that choice is created by the structures we set in place. I, I think the thing my colleagues haven't said explicitly, and maybe is particularly the, the education mission of a university, is that actually we as a society talk about subsidizing something like rail, but we never talk about how much we subsidize the road system. So actually all mobility costs money, and I think some of the costs are hidden and some of the costs are not. And so an important role of policy is to sort of work out over time making more of the costs, um, sort of direct costs yeah. and, and paid costs. And, and people often say, and, um, you know, well, that, that will hurt the lower income folks. Well, we have ways to support, you know, yeah. um, the transportation of different subsets of the population, but we can't keep the whole system wrong 
uh, protecting one segment. We have to, we have to move the system forward. Uh, just Please. really quick, yes. just to say, do you have questions? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, we heard about the empty buses, and as a transport person and as a public transport person, you know, I've heard this for, for, for decades, but I encourage you to go have a look at the, the 401 this morning at 3.30 in the morning, and you'll have 16 lanes um, in each direction cutting through the core of Toronto that is vacant, that is creating unfortunate runoff into our communities. It is dividing society. It is serving no purpose except to derive, except to diminish the land value of everything around it. And so nobody perceives this as, as a detriment. In Boston, they spent $4 billion to build a central artery that divided the city in half. And five decades later, they spent $14 billion to put that artery back underground to reconnect the city. So we have to think about these things systematically and think about the, the, the construction of what's happening. If I can Sorry, pick I up on the empty bus, too, if that's okay. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, I, um, I, um, I grew up in, in Switzerland, where I'm originally from, and uh, it's actually sometimes in rural areas, it was a bit of a joke my grandpa would make and say, oh, you know, look all the people on the bus, they're tying their shoes again, right, because you couldn't see anybody. Um, and um, that's a grandpa joke. Um, but ultimately, um, you know, my, um, when I speak to planners in Switzerland, I'm, my uncle actually was a planner in Switzerland for two to three decades, a uh, transportation planner. Um, and he often would say, well, you've got to run some empty buses. Right? And I would try to make sense of, well, why would you want to run empty buses? He said, well, you've got to run them so that you have network coverage and so that a bus is running if somebody wants it. The beauty of the automobile is it's sitting right out of my garage. Well, I don't have a garage. It's in my driveway. Um, and I can grab it when I want. If the bus system isn't frequent and covers most of where people want to go, you're not going to have people giving up the car for transit, for instance, right? They're, they're going to have to rely on an alternative option. And so sometimes, yes, you might run an empty bus. It's not ideal, of course, right? But, but you see that even in contexts um, like Switzerland, where, you know, if we're going to play into a stereotype where efficiency is quite valued. <laughs> because there's a recognition that you might cross-subsidize some of these transit lines so that the whole system gets more ridership exactly. if people can go everywhere by public transit. Yeah, so thank you, thank you all. You make my job a lot easier. <laughs> um, but for the, the last uh, 10 minutes or so, um, I, I wanted to talk a bit about you know, the, the future. I mean, there's a lot of things that have, have changed in the past. You know, So I was born and raised in the GTA, you know, born in Scarborough, grew up in Mississauga, I live in Toronto. You know, a lot of things have changed in the past 40-something you know, years um, in transportation. Um, what, what do you think we'll, we'll see in the next you know, 5, 10, 15, 20 years? So this is a, a long-standing problem, but we've talked about this um, in transportation, at least in urban transportation forever, and, and we call it the last mile problem, right? So we are always investing in corridors. So the subway runs, the streetcar runs. In Waterloo, we have now 19 kilometers of LRT, but it's still the connectivity between these real <coughs> corridors and where the origins and the destinations are. So if you are two kilometers from the LRT line and your destination on the far end is another two kilometers, that LRT line isn't going to be really competitive unless that access and that egress is right for you. And so I think in the next five to 10 years, what really needs to happen is we need to finally solve this problem of the connectivity between the major investments and then all of the disparate origins and destinations. And that's where I think electricity really has an enormous opportunity because if you think about traveling by bicycle or walking, there is a time deterrent, there's a, a physical energy expenditure deterrent, there's a climate deterrent, those kinds of things. And as soon as you introduce some um, mobility, electric mobility, that takes your travel time for those two kilometers, instead of being a 20 minute walk, it is now a, an eight minute scooter ride, um, it can be really effective. And when that scooter service is integrated with the transit, so you don't have to pay twice, that that works. Um, and so the economic signals, are, again, are right for that. It makes a lot of sense. And I think that when we integrate the systems and we use electricity at the micro scale, as well as at the meso and macro scales, that's what I think the, the immediate future is for, for long term, uh, for, for short term sort of evolution of the system. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. Uh, Lisa or Marcus? Okay. Um, I guess my role on the panel is to talk about freight and long distance, but if you're asking about the, net, the future, you know, I, I kind of have to raise my fantasy um, future uh, for Canada and for the United States, which is that we, we bust open this suburb land use problem. So the transportation problem um, there is, is out of control. It would be great, let's divide all those giant houses with two-car garages into two, let's put a tiny home in the backyard, let's put 
some uh, other land use near them so we have uh, access by proximity instead of access by mobility. I think that, that what I, I have complete confidence in the Waterloo engineers and researchers and our collaborators elsewhere that we can do the technology, uh, whether it's the, the batteries or the fuel uh, that's needed in ships. I, I really think we can do that. I think that what we as transportation professionals struggle with is the landscape that people are living in for their activities that we find so difficult to service. We, we can do the technology, let's, let's change the landscape, I think. Yeah, sorry. if I, uh, maybe I'll just pick up on Go the ahead, land please, piece, um, <laughs> the, um, I think this is so important, particularly now in an Ontario context where, you know, we have a, a provincial government that's moving away from the tri type of land use um, uh, policy guidance that actually would suit more sustainable transportation. And so we are hearing, you know, lots of news about new lands being opened up at the fringe of our cities. And I think the big and new highways being proposed, I think the big question is, you know, if those things continue to go ahead, ahead, I think we have two ways to deal with it. One of them is to sort of say, well, okay, ultimately when you build at the fringe of cities, yes, you're building generally on agricultural land in southern Ontario, and or you're building on ecologically significant lands serving various functions that our species needs to thrive on. Um, but also, at the same time, right, if, if you are building there, what are we doing to invest in transportation, public transportation technology, so that these new areas don't, aren't just replicating the problems we've done in the past. So I'm, you know, I, I don't like hearing when we're, when we're spreading, of course, as cities, because we know inherently the, the problems that that creates for our carbon footprint. But at the same time, when you are growing, and cities do grow, um, it's as much a question about what you build and how you preemptively put in place transportation infrastructure, right? Public transit is often the last thing that's thought about mm -hmm. in North American planning. Uh, it, it is not everywhere the case. Um, yeah, you can right. plan for transport before you build. So in Phoenix, they built outward. Phoenix is the fastest growing metropolitan area in the, in the States for, for decades now. And then after 60 years of decentralization, um, they built a single LRT line. <laughs> and you know, it, it travels through the urban core of Phoenix and it's not gonna correct the problem. And so thinking about transportation first is, is really important. And just one other comment on, on the land uses. One thing we're actually better at in Canada than many places is density. We build housing at higher density. What we do terribly is diversity. So you can have these massive subdivisions that if you want a, a liter of milk, um, you have to get in your car and drive five kilometers to get a liter of milk. If you want a coffee, there's no place to get it because we just have such homogeneity of our, of our land uses. And I guess the last thing I'll say is we have to be careful about the actual physical in infrastructure in our new development because if you walk through Mississauga, Nobody walks in Mississauga. Uh, <laughs> but if you were to visit Mississauga by car, you would get a very different sense of the scale of the auto infrastructure than you will if you walk out the door here. Because this is built at a human scale, and when you build for, for homogeneous suburban areas, you build it in a way that precludes all the other transportation modes from functioning there. Great. Thanks. I just wanted to uh, wrap up the last uh, couple of minutes that we have here. Um, I mean, in, in this room, we have obviously people from University of Waterloo, from Mars, um, we have students, we have academics, we have uh, government representatives, industry representatives. There, there's a lot of brain power here. So can you tell us a bit about, you know, collaborations that are you know, happening now or collaborations you'd like to see um, so that we can mobilize with, you know, this brain trust that we have and have Ontario lead in the sure. sustainable journey? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'll go quick. Um, I, like Lisa, I have a transportation dream. Imagine that we um, tomorrow decided as a community that we were gonna invest in, in a corridor, a rail corridor that would connect, I'll say from Quebec to Windsor to Niagara with branches on this end. And we invested in really high-end technology that was, um, that was going to be really sustainable, that was going to be effective. And you know, I don't pretend to be a technology expert. We've heard lots of interesting things about inner city rail today. But my dream becomes that that private sector investment that is part of that rail system is funded publicly and it's funded in a way that then is recovered by tolls that are imposed on, the hi on Highway 401. And this is a combination of the provincial government, a combination of the private sector. We can demonstrate new technologies and we can connect this urban corridor in a way that the Highway 401 won't be one of the single biggest obstacles to economic development in the GTHA for, for the next three or four decades. We need to introduce alternatives first, and that's why you build the rail line first, and then you tax afterwards to repay the, the public sector investment. 
into the, into the uh, transportation network that we've created. Thanks, Lisa. Uh, so my colleagues in California talk about the three transportation revolutions, so electrification, automation, and sharing. And uh, I think some of the collaborations we need uh, as engineers, which I, I'm from the Faculty of Engineering, are, are in this sharing. So you know, automation and electrification, we have a pretty good idea of the system to do that. But the behavior change to get the sharing we need, like we can instantly make that car a, you know, better per passenger mile by putting four people in it. And so I think the collaborations with social scientists on sharing the behavior change is important. Yeah, thanks Lisa. Marcus? I think there's three things I want to say there. One of them is that innovation needs to happen and I'm so motivated in a, being in a room today where people are seeing the need for change. Um, that innovation has to translate into changes in how we govern and organize ourselves as a society as much as it does in technology. And so sharing is a good example of that, right? Um, how do we get people to use resources more efficiently? Some of that has to do with using it collectively. I think of snowblowers on my street. Lots of them, <laughs> but they get shared. And sometimes people say, oh, wouldn't it be nice if we all could have somebody that just comes down? And say, well, like, well, we have a system in place, we call that the public sector, where we all pitch in resources <laughs> and we do things together. <laughs> sometimes we forget that there's some efficiencies there. Um, the second thing is, you know, we can't separate transportation from land use. Those things go hand in hand when we think about transportation in isolation or vice versa. We're gonna create problems that have higher carbon emissions, that have higher environmental significance. And then third um, is for whom, right? For whom is the technology? <coughs> Who's gonna have access? Um, those are essential questions. We know that when societies change, and we're in a period of not only change, but where the speed of change is increasing, we know historically when societies change, the biggest impact and the hardest time for transitioning is often for the most marginalized populations. So if we do say, well, we're advocating for change, and there are a lot of reasons we need to change as a society, how are we ensuring at the same time that those who have been historically most marginalized aren't yet again left behind in a transition to a more green economy? Yeah, excellent points. Well, thank you so much, Lisa, Jeff, Marcus. You've been an amazing panel, and, and thank you. You've been an amazing audience. <laughs> Thank you very much, Lisa, Jeff, Marcus, and Jesse for leading the panel. Great discussion. Marcus, we're gonna have to work with you, work on you with you and your car. <laughs> <laughs> we do understand that you are talking about the human condition, not you in particular. Um, we live in a very privileged society where we, we need to have these discussions. You know, there are millions and millions of people around the globe who don't have cars as a routine in the driveway. So all of us here, we really need to think hard about this issue and think about global travel, global transportation, while of course balancing the needs of the population and what we need to do in order to grow sustainably in our communities. I want to thank, you know, we need to really say thanks, all of the innovators, all of the students who are spending time working on these issues, the entrepreneurs in the audience, um, on our business leaders, a big shout out to you for working and disrupting and innovating this space, really appreciate it. And collaboration is so important in this space. Um, you know that the University of Waterloo loves collaborating with business leaders, so if you see ways that we can collaborate further with you, don't hesitate to reach out on the innovation and the uh, partnership side. I'm happy to hear from anyone who's interested in that sort of collaboration. I should also say thanks to Mars for their collaboration on supporting this innovation summit at the university. Um, I also know that we have many, many alumni in the room. And alumni are really important to our, our university's growth. We need to hear from you. Thank you so much for attending this event. And you know, if you need to hear how you can participate in the university further, we love your ideas. Uh, many of you in the room here, our alumni are really young. Some of you are business leaders. We'd love to be able to connect with you further. Just let us know 
how we can support your needs. And if you have ideas about what we should be doing in this space, what other sorts of summits need to be led by us, please let us know. We're, we're listening to your voices. We'd love to be able to support what you think is an important conversation to be held here. This brings us to the end of the summit. I want to thank everybody for being here today. I hope you had an opportunity to network well. And you know, please feel free to stick around a little bit more and chat with the people at your table or chat with others. And again, business leaders, entrepreneurs, if you want to connect, I'm right here. Thanks again, everyone. Thank you.